Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are going to be waiting just a couple more minutes because we still have a number of people logging in and we will get started in just a couple minutes. Okay, good morning, everybody. We are going to get started. Welcome, my name is Scott Kreinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager here at the WaterWise Community Center. And I am very happy to connect with you this morning for our retrofitting wand sprinklers for WaterWise and California Native Gardens workshop. Just a quick note before we get started, uh, we're going to see lots of information today and you will be able to review this information because I am sure that if you are actually going to um, go from this workshop and then make changes to your irrigation system, which is the point of it all, that uh, you will want to review some of the stuff. And so you have a couple ways to do that. The way you can re-watch this presentation, which is being recorded, is you can go to the website, the URL down at the bottom of the screen, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And that will take you directly to a YouTube playlist of past recordings of all of the workshops that we've taught online over the past couple of years. And you can rewatch all of this information. Uh, currently there is uh, a recording of the time that I taught this workshop around this time of year last year. So even though it's going to take a little while for us to uh, lightly edit this and get this up, all of the information is available online as well currently today. So you can rewatch that right away if you want to. There's also a whole playlist of supplemental videos to support some of the stuff we're talking about today where you can kind of follow me step by step as I make some of those irrigation modifications and some example landscapes. And we will look at that later on in the presentation. There are a few slides that you might want to actually uh, have available just to look at the individual slide as a reference. And you can download a PDF file of all of the slides of this presentation as well. If you go to cbwcd.org slash presentations, that's cbwcd.org slash presentations, the top URL on the screen. That'll take you to a page that are download links to all of the slideshows. So you can just find retrofitting lawn sprinklers for WaterWise and California Native Gardens. The easiest thing to do is to right click and do save as because it's a pretty large file to download. Or if it launches and uploads in your browser, then you can uh, just wait a few minutes for it to load because it'll take a few minutes and then save from there. So I'm gonna type those into the chat in case people do not have a pen and a paper to write that down right now. cbwcd.org slash presentations for the slides and cbwcd.org slash YouTube to get to the main YouTube workshop playlist. And so with that, let's get going. Before we jump into the main content, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the agency that I work for, who we are and what we do. We are the WaterWise Community Center. It's what we call ourselves for the public. Our formal name of our agency is the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. We are a very small government agency. Technically, we're a special district that was formed by a public vote in 1949 to provide water conservation services to the western edge of San Bernardino County. So we don't provide like drinking water to anybody at their house. We work on water conservation and we work in collaboration with and very closely with our area's local water providers in this western side of San Bernardino County. We say our mission is threefold, to percolate, to demonstrate, and to educate. Groundwater management through aquifer replenishment, through managing and maintaining a series of large, essentially holes in the ground that bring in 
water when it rains that would otherwise leave our community and through natural processes, uh, clean it and allow it to replenish our groundwater has long been the bread and butter of our agency is very important in our local area. Uh, this Chino Basin, which is basically what our agency was formed to steward, uh, provides 60% of our local water supply, which is a huge resource uh, compared to most communities in Southern California. However, on the demand side, what we do with that water, we also work in conservation because it doesn't do that much to save a bunch of water percolated into the ground and then not use it wisely uh, out in the community. And so to that end, we have a free demonstration garden showing many different approaches to water-wise landscaping because most of the water in the typical household in our area is actually used outside in the landscape. Uh, and that is at our headquarters facility in Montclair, open six days a week. You can check out our website for all the details and hours. And we also do lots of education for all sorts of different groups from programs for community members like this to more one-on-one -on -one programs, helping uh, community members in our local service area with uh, advice on irrigation systems and advice on landscape design to professional training and curriculum integrated K through 12 programs as well. Easiest way to stay up to date with everything that we are doing and find out about all of our upcoming workshops and programs is to sign up for our newsletter, which is very easy to do, cbwcd.org slash newsletter, and you won't get any junk. We don't share your email address with anybody else, just one email a month updating you on everything that we have going on. So if you don't get that, highly encourage you to sign up. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself before we jump into it uh, to know kind of why I'm talking to you about this. Uh, so I come with a, I guess, many year background in the landscape industry, doing a lot of stuff, everything from landscape maintenance and overseeing landscape maintenance, as well as landscape construction management, uh, all that sort of stuff. But my focus uh, is really in landscape uh, design. I have a master screen landscape architecture and kind of the integration of landscape design to like how the landscape is actually going to survive long term. And in Southern California, that has a lot to do with a good irrigation system and good irrigation practices, not too much and not too little. Beyond that, I'm an avid home gardener. I've helped a lot of people uh, install home landscapes, done a bunch of places that I've lived, you know, helped my parents go through their turf removal. And so I've done the kind of home scale uh, irrigation system modifications that we are going to talk about quite a bit. And a lot of what we are going to talk about and some of the techniques that I recommend are things that I've kind of developed project after project, year after year, in terms of what I find are the most reasonable uh, and most successful long-term approaches that will work for these sort of home garden transitions. And so with that, uh, I am going to launch a very quick poll. And when I do that, there's a little glitch in Zoom, so thanks to the screen share. Uh, just a few quick questions that help us get some of our metrics uh, to track our programs. If you can please quickly fill out the answers and then we will get started. Thank you very much. So some people are done already. Awesome, thank you. We'll give just another moment or so. For those of you who are joining us from other areas not mentioned in the list, please type into the chat where you're joining us from. Everybody is very welcome. But we are interested to hear where people are coming from. And I just adjusted something on the back end. Get the screen share going again. We have San Diego, Orange County, Tampa, Florida. Learned about it through the Los Angeles Master Gardeners. Awesome. Westlake Village, a pretty similar uh, climate to where we are here, Torrance. And so the, the things that we talk about are going to work you know, no matter where you are. Some of you from Torrance, Santa Monica, who are kind of more on the coast, might be able to water a little bit less during some of the slides that we show later on. But really, all of this is going to uh, apply. A question from uh, an attendee already. Uh, are we going to talk about bioswales today? We are not. We are talking about 
irrigation systems, like things that actually apply water. Bioswales are awesome and important to talk about. We talk about those and how to build them extensively in our rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop, which we normally teach closer to the rainy season because we talk a lot about site observation as part of the process of designing that. However, if you want to learn about that, uh, you can check out our recording of the last time we taught it on our YouTube channel. And part of the reason why in Southern California, we don't cover things like bioswales in irrigation is because uh, it doesn't rain most of the year. So especially in an inland area, even if we're working with native plants, we are generally not going to be relying on things like rainwater capture to take care of all of the water needs in our garden. And there's so much to talk about with like the water distribution kind of coming from uh, piped water that this workshop focuses on that. Okay, thank you very much to everybody who filled out the poll. I really appreciate it. And so the last thing that I am going to cover before we move on is how to interact with me and ask questions today. Uh, what we find is that to keep these workshops running and make sure we cover all the content for everybody, we don't have people raise hands and then call on them because there's a lot of downtime with the audio kind of back and forth and all of that. And so to answer or to ask questions, please type into the Q&A function in your Zoom menu. So there's a, a part in your uh, kind of control bar that says Q&A and it has two chat bubbles uh, or two text bubbles. Uh, you can click on that and that'll launch a, a little Q&A answer or question and answer form. That allows me on the back end on my screen that I see to very easily track the questions coming in. And then in between different sections at a good point to pause, I will answer all of the relevant questions that have come in. Because we have a lot of content to cover today, the questions that I answer as we go will be more focused on the stuff I've just been talking about. If you have kind of more individual questions about how would this affect my specific yard, uh, some of those might have to wait till the very end, but I'm happy to stay until after our end time at noon to make sure I answer as many questions as I possibly can. Feel free to type into the chat function. The chat function is more for comments and I definitely read all of those and try to keep my eye on that a little bit as things go. But if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A specifically because that's a lot easier for me to uh, check those questions as we go and make sure I get them answered. And so with that, we ended the poll and we will get going. With our first slide, which basically sets up our question. If you are thinking about removing a lawn or if you have removed a lawn, but have the old lawn irrigation system in, even if it's a little bit more modern than this spray system, you need to ask yourself, what would a sprinkler like this do in your new garden? We sometimes get people coming in to the WaterWise Community Center, showing us pictures on their phone, wondering why their new garden, which was doing great at the beginning and is now about a year old, has a lot of plants dying. And sometimes the answer is that they're still relying on their old spray sprinkler irrigation system. And what's happening is the closest plant, because now instead of a flat lawn, we have all sorts of wonderful different levels of small, medium, and large size plants. The closest plant is blocking the spray of this sprinkler. That closest plant is getting way too much water and everything on the other side of that plant is staying very dry. And so that's essentially the challenge is when you move from a flat plane, these turf irrigation systems, whether they pop up two inches or four inches, they almost never pop up higher than that, uh, are not set up for a garden of more varied heights. And so generally, you need to make some sort of conversion, some sort of change in the physical design and build of how your system works, even if you had a pretty good irrigation system for your turf, or especially if you had a terrible one. And that's what today's workshop is going to focus on. We're also going to focus on how to then appropriately use that for your new water-wise planting. And so here's basically the outline of what we are going to cover today. What's the point of irrigation anyways? Uh, let's ground ourselves in that and why it's important to get this right. 
Then we're going to go through recommended irrigation, irrigation system types and the advantages and disadvantages of each one. There's no perfect one size fits all. It can always be recommended as the best irrigation system approach. It just, it depends on what's going to work for you and what's going to work for your site and your landscape. So we'll talk about all of that. And then we'll start to go from those larger concepts into design. So we'll cover the essential concepts for your irrigation system design. We'll look at some system design examples, and then we will spend as much time as we can going through how to build the two main approaches that we're going to talk about. And then I'll also share with you, I'll show you online where we have the playlist of supplemental videos that really spend a lot of time just focusing on that. And you can see the video of those conversions happening or parts of those conversions happening to where you can understand how to actually do it. It's better to see on video than it is to see on slides, although slides should be helpful. And then finally, we will hopefully spend some time on now that you have that built, talking about irrigation schedules, how long to run your irrigation system for these types of systems for water wise and California native gardens. That's really, that could be a whole other workshop. That's really going to be kind of supplemental at the end, and we will get as far into it as we can. However, on that uh, YouTube playlist, there is a whole, uh, I think it's like an hour and 20 minute long kind of supplemental video that just spends a lot of time thoroughly going through that. And so you can use that as well to kind of review the overview and really get into the details as you think about your irrigation system settings. And so we will get into it about halfway through, we will take a quick five minute break as well. So starting with what is irrigation anyways, and what's the point? Irrigation for people who are gardening for the first time seems very mysterious. Uh, it is often one of the limiting factors of people being successful. Uh, it, it is one of the main things that I see people not getting quite right and plants either suffering or not growing optimally because of it. Oftentimes, it is too much water rather than too little, especially after plants uh, go through their first year and are starting to get established. But sometimes people are on the other side and provide too little as well. And so it doesn't need to be rocket science. And I'm going to give you some tips and some general guidelines throughout this to try to make sure you get into that sweet spot. Because irrigation properly used is primarily to supplement the natural rainfall or moisture availability to plants to make conditions more like a plant's natural home. That's especially true if we're growing plants from wetter areas. In our true California native gardens, growing local native species, it is also to keep our plants from going fully dormant. So we're not trying to keep them huge and lush and growing in the depth of summer where they kind of want to slow down, but it is to keep them a little bit more hydrated, looking a little better, even if they could survive with no irrigation, just providing them a little bit, keep them looking nicer. And then if you happen to live in an area in like the urban wildland interface, that fire might be an issue. It's also to help keep some hydration in the plant material. So it's less likely to burn if a fire should come through. No matter what kind of plant you have, it is critical to get newly planted plants established. So like with our driest plants here in Southern California, our local California native plants, we'll probably only be supplementally watering them once a month after they get established every three to four weeks here inland, uh, could be a little bit less on the coast. But the first year that they're in the ground, usually at the beginning, it's once a week, a good deep soak because we're transitioning these plants from their nursery pots in a very not natural situation. And we need them to get rooted into the native soil. We need those roots to spread out so they can start to be true low water plants. Uh, and then from there, we kind of taper it down. So we need to get those plants established. You know, in the wild, those plants don't get that, but in the wild, there's thousands of seeds that are gonna come off of the parent plant in a season. Very few of them are going to survive. In our home gardens where we're paying you know, 12, 13 bucks for each one gallon plant, we wanna have much better odds than that. And then finally, the right amount of irrigation, not too much, not too little, will help our plants grow, will help them resist pests and diseases. And if you happen to be you know, growing like fruit trees or things like that, which we're not really gonna focus on in this class, uh, it also helps produce a good yield as well. So not too much, not too little. 
Irrigation improperly used, whether it's too much or too little, will leave plants either stunted or as we see with native plants that are getting overwatered sometimes, excessively large. And if you're thinking about edible plants, just kind of in general, won't produce a good yield. Uh, too much or too little irrigation will encourage the presence of pests and diseases. In California native plants, overwatering in the summer leaves plants prone to fungal soil diseases. And that is one of the leading killers of California native plants is too much water in the summer. So not too much, not too little. It will also leave those plants more vulnerable to pests and diseases, whether they're drought stricken or whether they have too much lush growth from too much water that becomes uh, vulnerable to pests like aphids and other little critters that suck the juices off that very, very succulent growth. And it could also potentially create issues with nutrient availability in the soil for the growth of those plants. So we want to get it right down the middle, not too much, not too little, but I will provide you with some general guidelines, but that's just, just to kind of set up the importance of doing this. We need a physically good system to get water where it needs to be, not have all the sprays being blocked. And we need to have the right amount, not too much, not too little. And so when we apply that irrigation, what are we trying to do in the soil? This slide looks complicated, but I'm gonna break it down. But it is very important to get the general concept. So oftentimes when I am talking with people who are having problems with their water-wise gardens growing in, or things seem like they're growing like it's been years and they're still you know, tiny and stunted, I ask people how often they water. And sometimes they get the frequency right. It's been a few years they're watering, uh, you know, once every three or four weeks. And then I say, when you water, how much water are you applying? Or how far down into the soil is that wetted area penetrating? Is that water penetrating? How deep are you watering? And oftentimes those people don't know the answer. They've never dug down. And so what's happening is they're coming through their garden. They're just kind of spraying the hose here and there, and they don't no. Oftentimes in those cases, once I ask many more questions, we kind of diagnose the problem is that things are, are getting just only a very light watering and that water, and sometimes that light watering is too often, the water never penetrates down through the root zone of the plant. It doesn't penetrate 12, 18 inches deep when it's watered. And that's our goal is we want to irrigate through the root zone of the plant, through the depth where most of our plant roots are, which you're going to be aiming for you know, a foot, foot and a half. It's true that on mature trees, the roots can go much deeper, but we don't need to irrigate all the way down each time. And most of the roots that are going to be looking for water are going to be in those top 18 inches-ish. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. However, for people who overwater or water too much, what happens is if you keep watering and keep watering, that water is going to keep going down into the soil. And once that water goes below the root zone, essentially you're not helping your landscape. All you are doing is taking clean water that's been treated at the water treatment plant and you are paying for and you're recharging the groundwater table. Uh, you're not benefiting your garden once you go past the root zone. You're not, and that could also you know, be negative for the local water supply because it takes quite a while for that water to recycle through the whole system. So what we are aiming to do now we're going to get into what these terms mean and these concepts is when we irrigate our water wise or California native gardens, we are aiming to bring the depth of the main root zone of our plants, foot, foot and a half, up to what's called field capacity. That means that the soil is holding all of the water it can without going in that root zone way into what's called saturation, where water is moving down farther down beneath the root zone. We don't need to recharge that with, with our irrigation water. We are trying to do that before it reaches what's called the wilting point, which is where the plants are significantly wilting and it will cause physiological harm, You know, something like dieback or stunted growth to our plants. And so we water at the right time, not too early, not too late, bring that root zone depth up to that field capacity. That's the general concept. 
One thing to keep in mind though, is on very hot days, some plants will look a little wilty in the middle of the day. That's something called midday depression. And that could be normal. What you want to do is if you feel the soil, if the soil feels bone dry, not just at the top, but you know, dig down with a trowel a few inches down. If it's bone dry, bone dry, maybe you need to water. But if you have watered recently, or if you feel that there's still moisture a couple inches down, then come back after it's cooled off for a while in the evening and check. Oftentimes that plant will have rebounded. If the plant has not rebounded, you really know that it does in fact need that water. And then remember when we're talking about watering that root zone, I kind of mentioned this, but this, this kind of shows uh, graphically like what we're talking about with trees. People often think that the root zone of a tree is kind of just the canopy reflected downwards. And that's not really the case. And when we talk about watering the root zone of a tree or even a large uh, water-wise plant, they have a similar pattern. There might be some structural anchoring roots that go down farther, but most of the roots of the plant are going to still be within that top 18 inches, maybe two feet. And where that plant is going to be looking to gather most of its water resources after it's established and is rooting in is going to be near what's called the drip line of the plant, the edge of the canopy of the plant, a little bit farther out, a little bit farther in, but not right down at the base of the plant. And so some of you who've maybe worked with drip irrigation before and have worked with those little uh, button emitters on the spaghetti tube where there's one or two that are put at the base of the plant are thinking, huh, may, that doesn't really necessarily line up with how those drip systems are set up. And that's absolutely true. We'll talk about that more later on. Plants generally want to be watered where they want to gather that water physiologically. And that's going to be closer to the outside of the canopy of that plant, a little bit in, a little bit farther out, not right at the base. And that is critically true for water-wise and California native plants. They do not want their water concentrated at the base of the plant. Think about what happens when it rains, whether it's a shrub or a tree, the canopy of that plant intercepts the rain. And as the water falls down, falls down through all the leaves, it's kind of channeled to fall around this outside zone. It's part of why it's called the drip line. So, and it doesn't generally pool right at the base of the plant. And so with some of the approaches to setting up drip irrigation, where all that water goes right at the base of the plant, when you're transplanting your nursery pot into the ground and all the roots are right there at the base for that first few months, things are fine. But oftentimes with the systems that keep that water concentrated at the base, by year three, a lot of the plants are dying. The water is not being applied where it wants to be applied. And then beyond that, irrigation is a little bit like art in the fact that, you know, for a great painter, a great painter is not defined by having the best paintbrush. Uh, there's more to it than that. The same thing is true of irrigation. We need to do the basics. Our irrigation system needs to get water to the plant where it wants it. But beyond that, it's much more about kind of understanding the plant needs, uh, watering at the right frequency, not too much, not too little. And it's definitely not, spray systems are the best. Drip systems are the best. Uh, some people are very opinionated about it. I've used all the approaches in many different situations. And I am convinced that it really is what's going to be the best for you and your situation. You can be successful with native plants with drip irrigation, as long as the water is going where the plant wants it and not too much and not too little. Same thing with spray irrigation. Uh, it can be very efficient. Uh, it's not necessarily that drip is, is the uh, only way to go. You, it's going to be what's best for you and what works best for the physical layout of your site. And so we will talk about how to assess what's going to be better for you. And so before you even jump into that, you want to assess what's left of your current irrigation system in the area that you are thinking about doing this retrofit or conversion. And a lot of what we are going to talk about can also be very relevant to areas that did not have a turf irrigation system to begin with. 
If you really don't have a turf irrigation system to begin with, you are going to need to probably put in valves, uh, run all new pipe. And that goes beyond what we can talk about really in this workshop. Uh, putting in valves can be somewhat complicated because you're going to be working on the main line of uh, your house. It's pressurized all the time. That pipe really needs to be put together well. Uh, and so there are general resources online, plenty of videos on YouTube about that. We don't really get into that. And in, in most of the cases, when we work with people who are kind of hobbyist gardeners or homeowners wanting a nice garden and are going to be doing the work themselves, if they don't have plumbing experience and they don't have anything, I encourage you to at least have a plumber or irrigation professional probably put in your valves. After that, you can kind of go from there. For most of what we're going to be talking about, which is often what we see, uh, we are going to be focused on assuming that there are some pipes in the ground, maybe they're abandoned, maybe they're old, and how to kind of retrofit, and make the most use out of what is already there. Uh, and we will talk about how to fix certain things as well. We also have, in terms of the more irrigation basics, a whole number of other irrigation classes about basic repairs and things like that, that you can check out. Some of them we have upcoming doing them live like this. Uh, other ones you can check out on our YouTube channel. So in assessing your current system, if you have any major pipe breaks or leaks that are in need of repair, if you're gonna be reusing that underground pipe, take care of that first. Or if you have a ton of them, maybe you know that you're going to abandon things like back to where your valves are and, and rerun the pipe, but kind of think about that ahead of time. Do you have uh, four inch pop-up sprinklers, which is pretty standard, two inch pop-up sprinklers, which only pop up two inches, which are a little bit older, but some of them are still around, or those very old brass body sprinklers, which are the all metal ones. You will have slightly different options based on those, for what you are doing. And we will talk about all of that for the system types, but take a look at that, take that into account if you don't know which of those you have. Do you have functioning irrigation control valves? Those are those things, usually they're grouped together and they're the things that if you have a timer, uh, the timer tells them when to turn on and off. When they're off, which is normal, your system's not running. When the timer or the irrigation controller tells them to turn on with a little electric pulse, then they open up and it waters. Uh, do you have functioning valves? How old are they? Are they made by a reputable brand? And then if they're older ones, you might need to look on them and see, it, it will sometimes say their design flow range or you might need to look online. And that's if you are moving towards drip irrigation and are just putting in a very small area, that's when you need to look at it. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but some very old valves are do not close well if they're only irrigating a very small area on drip irrigation because they need a certain volume of flow to go through to kind of force that valve back closed. Uh, so don't get intimidated by that. I'm, I'm just kind of introducing you to all of those concepts now. And then we'll kind of, when we get specific in the examples, look back through. But just kind of really the big takeaway is, are the valves good enough to hopefully reuse, even if you need to like add maybe a pressure reducer onto them, or is it better to kind of start over? And then finally, Manually turn on your irrigation system. If you have a functioning timer, you can look up how to do that in your manual, or also if you don't have your manual handy, uh, just type the, the information that you see printed on the timer in terms of the manufacturer and the model number in online. And you can pretty much for all the manufacturers download a PDF file of the manual and go through it there. Uh, so look at how to turn on each area manually if you don't know how to do that, and then turn it on and then walk that area and look and listen for leaks or other things that would need to be repaired. So that way you can understand what's going on with your system and that might guide you to your choices you'll make in terms of your approach to retrofitting that system. And so we know why we need that new approach. What are our options? So we're gonna talk about three main options. The first option is what I actually uh, did in my front yard when I was doing my turf conversion, which was staying with a spray sprinkler system that shoots water through the air, kind of makes it rain in the area, not going to drip, but retrofitting it 
with instead of the little pop-up sprinklers that have a lot of mist and spray, the traditional lawn sprinklers, retrofitting it with taller sprinkler risers, solid risers that stick out of the ground and have a higher efficiency spray nozzle on it that does a much better job of not blowing away in a little bit of the breeze. Gets more water where you're aiming for. And so there are advantages and disadvantages. And we're gonna talk about that for each of these approaches. The advantages of just staying with spray and putting them on taller risers are usually it's less work and lower cost than going all the way to converting to a drip system. It can, if installed well, be almost as efficient as drip. And that's especially true because water-wise plants are going to send out these big root systems if they're getting watered in the zone where they want to be and kind of the right amount. And they don't need that perfectly even coverage long-term as a lawn. Like the lawn, if there is an area where the sprinklers don't hit, you know, even it's slightly drier, you're going to see that in a brown spot in the lawn. And then if you want that brown spot to go away, you need to water everything else that much more, even if you're overwatering to make up for that little dry spot. With water-wise and native plants, the plants are going to find that water if it's not as perfectly even. So, so with the good spray system, you don't necessarily need to like water extra like you would to make up for a system that's not perfectly even in a lawn. Spray sprinklers are easier to check for leaks and breaks and easier to maintain. If there's a break in a spray system, oftentimes you see it the next morning, there's a geyser, there's a big puddle of water where drip systems, if, if something uh, small breaks, you might not notice for quite a while. And although I truly believe that it is possible to be very successful with California native plants on drip systems, uh, as a default, native plants are sometimes healthier with overhead spray irrigation because it is like mimicking the rain when it, they get watered, everything kind of gets washed down, uh, the leaves get washed off, and then the mature canopies of those shrubs and, and, uh, and plants kind of can filter the water to where exactly that plant would naturally be infiltrating that water in a rain event. Disadvantages of sprays though, and there are definitely some, does not work well for planted areas that are less than 10 feet wide or that are oddly shaped because we don't want our sprinklers to be spraying onto concrete, onto walkways, onto asphalt. The sprinklers are seen, but you don't necessarily notice in a mature garden. And then another disadvantage that we will talk about later, but I just didn't think to put on this list is the fact that as your plants grow in, especially with your shrubs that are gonna start getting taller and taller, even if you start with the taller sprays, uh, the sprinklers might start to get blocked. You know, if, if a shrub is going to be six feet tall, might start to block, block that sprinkler. So it depends on your design. With a drip system, nothing is going to be blocked. And so that's an advantage of it. Talk about advantages. And so it, it really is going to be dependent on your design and which way you want to go. And so just to show you what that looks like, for our high efficiency rotating nozzles, even though these are pictures in turf, this is kind of what we're talking about. It's almost like a rotating fountain spray and they're more concentrated streams. And so you don't get that misting that you do from a traditional sprinkler. And so that is combined with putting your sprinkler on a solid riser. And so this is a picture from my front yard where you can see this is what we did. Uh, we had to move some of the sprinklers from their original locations, and we'll talk about how to do that. And some of them were able to be put in just where the original sprinklers were. And that's what you have. And you see it, but as the garden grows in, people don't really even notice it. And we will loop back around and talk about how to for all of these different options. Option number two is drip irrigation using inline emitters. So that's the tube like this, just as a preview, where you buy the tubes in 100 or 500 foot lengths coiled up, and you don't need to plug anything onto those. The emitters are already embedded at a regular length, and these are not just holes in the tube, but they're highly engineered emitters so that the exact same amount of water, if installed properly, is getting let out from all of these. 
This is in terms of getting water to the right place and in terms of durability without falling apart and having a lot of leaks, a totally different type of, of product than the drip systems that a lot of people put in, which have the little, what's called spaghetti tube, the tiny tube that has the individual buttons. Uh, this is more of a kind of commercial quality approach and it is more work, more material and more expensive to put in, but these systems will last potentially a very long time without a lot of maintenance and those other systems fall apart. So if you're gonna do drip irrigation, that's gonna kind of be the way to go. And we'll talk about what that looks like. And that is laid on the soil surface and then buried in mulch, whether it's wood chips or gravel or something like that. You don't need to dig that into the ground. The advantages are in terms of getting the water where it is intended to go, that's the most efficient. Plants will never block it. No sprays will be blocked. Everything is buried underneath the mulch. Visually, you won't see it as long as you keep a sufficient layer of mulch. And it's the only way to efficiently water with an automatic irrigation system, small or oddly shaped areas, if you don't want that irrigation to be spraying onto nearby surfaces or buildings. The disadvantages is that are that if you already have that in-ground kind of pipe system from a lawn, it's a lot of work and more expensive than converting to like a better spray system because there's a lot of materials to put down. If you are starting from scratch, the merits uh, become a little bit closer in terms of labor because there's generally less trenching involved with drip systems. You don't necessarily trench the whole perimeter, but if you already have that trenching and that buried pipe, it's gonna be more work to go for a drip system in a large front lawn. They are still, even though that kind of, this kind of system is much more resilient, much more robust than the little button emitter drip irrigation system, a drip system is still relatively fragile compared to a well-designed spray system. There will be more breaks over like a five or 10 year period for sure that will need to be fixed. It's not hard to fix them most of the time. In fact, it could be quite easy, uh, but seeing them and catching them is the main thing because you might not notice breaks until plants are stressed and water has been wasted, especially if you're in an area where there's like gophers or ground squirrels or things that might chew them apart. Um, okay, so we already kind of talked about this drip tube type. There's different brands, but in general, what I would recommend is you want to go to a specialty irrigation supply store to get this stuff. Uh, the big box hardware stores, the quality is, is hit and miss. Sometimes they'll have some stuff from a decent brand, but then other stuff, which I just do not consider decent quality. And the prices aren't going to generally be better than the specialty irrigation supply store or the landscape supply store. Also the staff at the landscape supply stores can generally help answer questions and make sure you are leaving with the right materials you need. And it's just gonna be a, a better experience to set you up for success overall. So if you are, in our local area, Western San Bernardino, Eastern Los Angeles County, we have a list on the same location, cbwcd.org slash presentations, where you can download the slides of this, where you can download our local landscape suppliers list. And we have the local irrigation and landscape supply specialty stores that carry this stuff. Uh, that's definitely what I would recommend. If you are in another area, look up landscape supply stores and you will find uh, Number of them, one's kind of small chains throughout Southern California, some of them in other states as well. Uh, names like Ewing, uh, Smith Pipe and Supply are kind of ones that, that carry this type of stuff. Site One is another name. And then locally here, there's, there's an independent shop in addition to all of those called Modern Irrigation. And so this is kind of what in a small area, apologize for the grainy photo, this might look like where this tube is looping back and forth. And we'll talk about the spacing that's gonna depend on soil type. And for a small area like this near a parking lot, I wouldn't ever do this with spray, uh, even though these plants would be fine with the spray system because there's gonna be no good way in an area this small to have spray that's not gonna be over spraying onto the sidewalk and out into the parking lot. And in a small area, it can just loop around like this, all come together. 
in a large area, this is what I was talking about, can be a lot of material. So I would probably default to actually doing this with spray if the height of the plants would be appropriate for spray. Because what you're doing when you do a proper drip system, what I consider to be a proper drip system is you are still kind of wetting the soil completely in a pattern as if it had rained. And so you can see the little circles of wetted area here. And if the drip system is spaced properly and the emitters are the right ones for your soil type, what happens is that these wetted zones, as the water goes underground, it continues to spread out a little bit more and a little bit more. And so the total wetted area in the root zone after you're a number of inches down in the soil is going to be all getting watered. And so if there's pathways or other things like that, those don't need to be watered. But if it's the root zone of the plants, then that whole area would be covered. And you can see in odd shaped areas, things can be kind of flexed around a little bit to accommodate for that. But you're keeping kind of a relatively even space and then just working around any obstacles. And so it can be quite a bit of work, but as those plants grow in and want to stretch out, that's going to that's really the only long-term successful way to work with drip irrigation. Those little button emitters that put all the water at the base of the plant are not really an option. And then finally, our option three would be to just abandon your sprinkler system, cap everything off, and keep it simple with a hose connected to sprinklers that you would move around and would set up temporarily in different spaces. This is what I do in most of my backyard where I have California native plants. I have really high efficiency irrigation systems on my fruit trees and my vegetable beds, but my native areas in my backyard are mostly getting watered maybe once a month. We keep it pretty dry back there. And then I have a small meadow area that gets watered every other week. And so advantages to this are it's way more inexpensive than either of those other, other uh, systems, even though I'm going to show you some products that are kind of more high end than a typical sprinkler you would get at the hardware store. There's not really as much technical information, not even close that you would need to learn as opposed to putting in a new sprinkler system or a drip system. And if you have a regularly shaped space, which means like a square or a rectangle, or in, for example, in my backyard, part of why we bought the property that we have is because as a large backyard, uh, our beds of native plants have like a lot of space around them. And so for any of those sorts of spaces, it can be efficient enough. So for example, my front yard, it's like a little wedge shaped. There'd be no way to have one of these hose connected sprinklers work. It'd be spraying the sidewalk, it'd be spraying the neighbor's driveway. It just would not work. But in my back area, I can water without overspray. If, if I had a rectangular front yard, uh, I could potentially do that. Can be efficient enough. It will be less efficient than either of those other two options. However, with the advantages of the fact that things will never be blocked because if plants start growing up, I'm just kind of setting it up each time. I'll realize I need to change the position or prop it up somewhere else. Uh, that kind of increases the effective efficiency. And if something leaks or breaks because I'm setting it up each time, I will notice. And so even though it's going to be less efficient in terms of the water landing exactly in the right place, it kind of makes up for that in other ways. There are some disadvantages though. This takes much, much, much more ongoing involvement in time because you're setting it up each time you're doing it. And so you need to be interested in taking this approach and being involved in your garden irrigation to really have this be successful and worth it. Most people I work with are not people who you know, want to be gardeners as their hobby. They just wanna have a nice water-wise garden and maybe have some of the nice advantages of a water-wise or native landscape. This is not going to be the best approach for them. I wouldn't encourage you to do this just to save time and money. For people who are like gardeners as a hobby and they are fine being out there, you know, making sure the plants get watered once a week at the beginning and then being out there you know, setting up the sprinkler each time the water needs to happen long term, this could be a way to go. But it doesn't work for those irregularly shaped areas and the coverage is not as 
good as a really well-designed like drip system, for example. And so I'm only going to talk just a little bit because this is a much simpler approach about the options for these hose connected systems. So I will just kind of talk about it quickly now. Uh, although in general, I don't like to recommend specific brands or specific products. I will say that I am partial to this as a hose connected sprinkler. If you are going to take this approach, this is what I use in my backyard. Uh, we just got one of these to do an area where a spray system is having too much blockage from plants that are growing in, in the Waterwise Community Center demonstration garden. Uh, so you can see the price tag on something like this is a lot higher than the old school fan sprinkler at the hardware store. But what I find is the old school fan sprinkler at the hardware store, although similar in theory to this, just doesn't have the adjustments that uh, nicer sprinkler like this can have, and the, the components aren't as good. They start leaking, they're not as long lived. I've had sprinklers made by this brand for seven, eight years, uh, and finally, you know, replaced them, but they, they really do last. Like for example, this brand, uh, the stuff is made in Germany. Uh, it's a product of, of you know, kind of like a high-tech German engineering put into a hose connected sprinkler. And generally, why I like them is because it's easy to avoid blockage of plants as they grow in, because this is generally how I use it in the landscape. Sprinkler goes on top, propped up in the right place and takes some trial and error to figure out where that is. Uh, sprinkler goes up on top of a couple of milk crates. And so for here, we keep this on a pattern where it only goes halfway in an arc. And you could set it if you want it to go way back, but here it just arcs this way. And it's right next to a shrub, but it's propped up enough. And then we test it where it's it's not really blocking anything at all. Whereas the little, the pop-up spray sprinklers, even though we had put one foot tall pop-up sprinklers, was still getting a lot of blockage as this landscape grows in. Uh, the, the milk crates themselves are, if you have access to milk crates, that's great. Uh, they are, and you can prop up anything them on anything. These are a couple of square ones that I purchased on uh, Amazon. Uh, they're expensive for plastic crates, but the quality of the milk crate material and the thickness and will last outside like a storage bins or something like that wouldn't. And then what I actually do to stabilize this is just zip tie, or you can otherwise secure onto the top milk crate. And then when I store it, I stack them, but this is just on the inside. So it kind of protects it. And you can see the adjustments uh, forward back. It adjusts the width of the spray and it adjusts the, the amount. And so this sprinkler itself, I think it said on here. Yeah, so you can adjust this as long as it's an even rectangular or squarish pattern if, to do anything from 76 square feet to 2,300 square feet. Oftentimes what I find is it's in the average landscape because most landscapes, maybe they're a series of rectangles. You still might have to set this up in two or three different places, uh, but sometimes you can just set it up in one. So that's kind of the idea. And just to kind of show you how this works. So here's an example of an area where I have a grade change. This is kind of like a terraced area that I made in my backyard. And I use this to water both the upper part of the terrace and the lower part sometimes, and then sometimes just the lower part because it's a meadow that gets watered a little bit more. And so connects into the hose, I adjust things. And then what I do is because every time you adjust it differently, uh, it's gonna need to run a different amount of time. If you adjust it on like run, doing a huge area, you're gonna need to water it for longer. And so one of the things why you need to be a little bit more involved is because with a drip system or a typical spray system, you know, you'll, if you run it for half an hour, it's always going to do the exact same amount of uh, irrigation. With this, if you're kind of continually adjusting it, it might not always be the same. And so you might learn your exact adjustment over time and then get it dialed down. But to keep things simple, I put out a couple of these are wide mouth pint mason jars. So they're basically just a cylinder. So these are my little rain gauges. And I put them out, for example, into this little natural meadow area. And then I run it. And then when we'll talk about how much water you want to apply, oftentimes for water wise and native gardens, when you're running it, it's about an inch, an inch and a quarter of, of water, like it had rained that much overnight. And so I turn it on and I keep an eye on it. And when there's that much water in the jars, that's when I know how to turn it off. In a larger area, I might put out more jars to kind of keep an eye on, on the average of things, but pretty simple. Uh, it's in, in this case, with like with my settings over time, I, I know that it's generally uh, a couple of hours 
when it's set up in this location, but I still keep an eye on it with the jars because it's just a very easy thing to do. And then with any of these, no matter what kind of sprinkler you're using, if you eventually learn how often things need to run, then you can put a little splitter on your hose, have one connected to a hose and another connected to just a timer, old style, nothing digital, no batteries, a uh, twist timer. And so you can set it up. And even if you're keeping an eye on the jar, I like these. So if I completely forget about it, it won't just like run all night and into the next day. That helps save water. If you are going to use one of these timers, whether it's for your main irrigation system or just a supplemental thing you set up every once in a while, I am partial to this one, which can be ordered online. Most of these timers are very cheap little things. And this one is not super expensive. I think it's like 20 bucks, but most of them, the body is all plastic. And so as you move the hose around, it's very easy to break. This is the only one that I've ever seen where the body is actually made of metal. The, the parts that connect to the hose and the hose bib are made of metal. And so it's just much more robust. And then finally, the last thing I will say about this, and then we will answer some questions and get back to our main systems for most of the rest of, of this, uh, is that there are all sorts of other approaches. So for example, in my backyard, in my main wider areas, I rely on that fan sprinkler. For smaller areas, like here's an example where I have a, a hedge along the edge of the property that's growing in a mixture of small trees and large shrubs. This is the other sprinkler that I use in my yard connected to the timer. And basically it's four parts. It's this metal part at the bottom that props up the sprinkler. It's this plastic sprinkler riser. It's a little adapter. And then it's a spray head like would go onto a normal pop-up sprinkler just attached onto it. This one, and I'll, I'll explain each of the parts. And, and this is partially uh, so you can reference it. But the, the main thing at the bottom is the sprinkler ring base. Uh, I've only seen this one online. Some of the local stores sell ones that are kind of made more of like wire and they're, they're pretty cheap. They don't last these. This is the price for two. So, you know, they still cost a lot less than if you're investing in, in a full in-ground irrigation system. Uh, the irrigation riser, which is, I use a two foot tall one and that could be get purchased at the local irrigation supply store. Uh, shrub head adapter that basically just goes from the size of the thread here to the much smaller size of the thread for your nozzle and then your nozzle and you can set up different things and we'll talk about how to test things later on to know how much water it's putting out but the one that i am most partial to is one called the rainbird sq pattern in a half so basically this little dot is where the sprinkler is and you can adjust it to do one of two things based on just turning the thing and it makes a click. One is closer and it goes two and a half feet in each direction and five feet out. And then how I generally use it, it goes four feet out and then four feet in each direction. So it's a total, it makes a four foot by eight foot rectangle. And so for doing shrubs, narrow areas, things like that where, or even just an individual tree, uh, that's very useful for smaller areas compared to the fan sprinkler for larger areas. And basically at that four foot setting, if you are going to make it water about an inch over that wetted area, again, we'll talk about that more later, but just for your reference, I know, for example, it goes for about two hours, turn, connect it, turn that timer on for two hours. And that's often something that I'll do like before I leave for work, I'll put it where it needs to go for that morning. I'll turn the dial and it'll automatically turn it off. And so I can kind of move that around to individual plants that might not need a lot of irrigation around it. And so I think we'll stop. We will answer some questions and then we will loop back around. And so from here, moving forward, we're going to be talking about assuming you are going to be doing an in-ground system and either spray or drip. We'll talk about general concepts for irrigation design for that kind of retrofitting your turf sprinkler system. And then we will spend detailed time on each of those approaches. So let's answer some questions. Uh, okay. Uh, 
So this is a question about the most important part. Uh, I have a drip system that we put in in the early 90s and have emitters going to the base of each plant that needs to need to be moved out periodically. So, okay, that's awesome. So it's good that you are moving them out periodically. Most people never get that far. Uh, and if you are going to keep it with the emitters going to the base of each plant, even though that's not what I would recommend to start with, like that's the way to, to have a chance to be successful with it. Would it be better to replace the emitters with micro sprinklers? So those are little mini sprays that you can connect to it spaced in between the plants, have a combination of Mediterranean, South African, Australian, Southwestern and California natives, all about the same water needs, uh, water every about three to four weeks. Uh, good question. So if you feel like you are being successful with those emitters that you have moved out because you already have that button emitter system, uh, then if you feel like you're being successful, then, then I'd say stay with what, what you have going on. If you feel like you need a change and you're not trying to redo the whole thing, I would say test, maybe if you can test an area going over to micro sprays, you might. In general, micro sprinklers, which are ones that can connect to the little spaghetti tube and our little spray, uh, are not what I would recommend if you are starting. However, in your particular situation, you can consider it, and I would say do it experimentally. The most important thing with the micro sprays is making sure that they are elevated to the ideal height. And so there's little extenders on some of them because oftentimes you need to elevate them up so that they're not just being blocked by the closest plant. And then it's very hard to, when you set up micro sprays, there's not a lot of good information from what I've found about exactly how much water they are putting out. And so you're going to want to kind of use those jars like I just showed and kind of test things and figure out your runtime because I've never found, spent a good amount of time trying to figure out like general runtime recommendations for those micro sprays and it's kind of all over the place. So you kind of need to test it on site, also dig some in the soil in between the plants, make sure you understand how long you need to run them uh, to do that. Or you could go back to where you connect it and replace it with uh, the inline emitters. That, that's an option as well. Uh, from Margaret, what about using a soaker hose for occasional watering around a large tree? Uh, absolutely, if you just have like a few large trees that don't have a preset irrigation system, then yeah, you can do that. Uh, a good quality soaker hose, uh, oftentimes, and a soaker hose is, as opposed to drip emitters, the soaker hose is a porous, oftentimes like recycled rubber that just connects to the hose and runs on the hose pressure. Uh, you can do that. So a 50 foot soaker hose. And then like we talked about for the tree, where does the tree want most of the water kind of around the drip line of the tree. And then I move it a little bit in, move a little bit out. Uh, you can do that for sure. Uh, soaker hoses, we generally don't recommend for like the main landscape irrigation type because they are much less even in terms of how much water actually ends up being let out at along the length of it compared to the other style drip irrigation that we showed. But a mature tree is going to find that water where it's available through a pretty good root depth. And so that is more of an approach, definitely. And we occasionally do that on some old oak trees that we have in our park here at the Waterwise Community Center. We just bought some, some new soaker hoses for that. The, the important thing with the soaker hoses is, uh, again, it's hard to calculate exactly how much water is going out. So you're gonna wanna do some testing, not right underneath the oak tree in the main root zone, but I'd say test it in an open area, run it for a while once the soil is dry, then dig down in the soil some and see how long that soaker hose is going to need to get that water to penetrate very well, like past at least a foot down or lower. So you're going to have to do some digging to really test it out. It's going to be hours. Uh, so I did some calculations for like our mature oak trees and with a soaker hose uh, to get the right amount of water to water that oak tree about once a month for our mature oak trees, which have a big canopy. Uh, it's about a six hour runtime with that soaker hose. For our younger trees, it's gonna be much less of a runtime. So hopefully that helps for soaker hoses. Uh, some great questions. And 
that is all the questions for now. So we will keep it going because there's a lot to cover still. So here are going to be some irrigation design essential concepts. Now, if we were talking about irrigation design, unfortunately, some of it does get a little bit complex, but as we go through, I will try to kind of simplify it and break it down as much as possible. Even if you don't fully absorb this stuff the first time around, you can check it again on the YouTube or just know for having thought about this stuff, you will be better off in making the considerations for your new irrigation system than most people are when they put in irrigation systems. So one key design rule, you can only put so much water safely through a pipe. And so when you are retrofitting or creating a new irrigation system, most of the time, a sprinkler system will have a combination of three quarter inch size pipe in the ground. And as it gets to smaller areas, some half inch size pipe in the ground. When you do irrigation design from scratch, it's important that you theoretically figure out your sprinkler design, how many sprinklers you need. And then you would actually look up the manufacturer's information in terms of how much water each of those sprinklers put out and then do some math. And what you wanna make sure is for a three quarter inch pipe, you are not putting more than eight gallons total from the demand required by all the sprinklers attached to that piece of pipe. You don't put out more than eight gallons per minute coming off of that pipe. And then if it goes smaller to a half inch pipe, you don't wanna put out more than four gallons per minute. And that's because normally our municipal water systems will be able to provide much more water than that. But to get more water through that pipe, it needs to move faster. And after those speeds, it's moving so fast that you can get what's called water hammer. So if, you know, a house with old pipes, you know, sometimes like when the toilet stops running or when the washing machine turns uh, on, you could hear the pipes rattling. Uh, that's the same thing. That's called water hammer. And that can damage the components of the pipes and cause leaks over time. Fortunately, in most of our irrigation system retrofits, especially with spray, because we are going from less efficient sprinklers that normally put water out a lot faster to more efficient sprinklers that put water out slower, normally we don't need to worry about this too much. Uh, with drip, we need to worry about it a little bit more because oftentimes we're just connecting to one or two spots and then putting out a lot of water into the landscape. But I have some guidelines as we go forward, just in general, in terms of like, you can put out this many feet of drip line to help stay within this range. So I've tried to make it so that you don't need to do as much math as possible with the guidelines that I will give later on. But this is the context to why I will be providing those guidelines. And then you want to make sure you have enough water flow. In most houses, this will be fine. Uh, basically, if your flow off of a hose bib on your property exceeds eight gallons per minute, then you will be able to design like for the maximum you would need. And most properties will easily exceed it. Uh, so this is in my backyard. And the easiest way to test the flow is to very quickly open a hose bib all the way with a five gallon bucket and see how quick that fills. For me, it was less than 30 seconds, which would be typical, which means that I can do at least 10 gallons a minute in terms of the full flow, which means I have plenty of water for anything I would need to design running through three quarter inch pipes because I don't want to exceed that. Where I occasionally see the exception to this on a property that's served by like city water, so like a rural well situation, sometimes you have a low flow, but in cities, mostly where I see this is older construction. So uh, we very rarely see houses that go all the way back to the 1920s and 30s that have not needed to replace their plumbing. But houses that were built in the 40s and 50s that still have the original galvanized piping, sometimes there's so much rust and corrosion on the inside of those pipes that the pipes have actually gotten quite a bit smaller than they look like on the outside in terms of where the water can run through. I used to rent a place that that was the exact situation. Uh, and the flow can be restricted in that situation. If the plumbing has been replaced on those older houses to modern copper or plastic, uh, generally they will have plenty of flow and in new construction, generally you will have plenty of flow. You also wanna test your water pressure. 
If your water pressure is not captured by a whole house pressure reducer, if you're sorry, if the water to your landscape is not captured by a whole house pressure reducer, you will normally need to do some amount of pressure reduction either before or after the valves on your irrigation system. Whether or not your landscape water supply is captured by a whole house pressure reducer, which is that kind of bell shaped thing that you often see outside of the house where the water, you see the water line come up and go into the house, that's the whole house pressure reducer. Whether or not that actually reduces the pressure to the landscape is just depending on how the property was originally plumbed. It's about a 50-50 chance from what we see in general, but don't assume that. So you want to test your water pressure. And if not, you will normally need to install a, a a uh, pressure reducer. And so a couple of ways to test this, and these tools are available uh, from the local irrigation supply store, is you can test the water pressure at a hose bib. However, if the hose bib is sticking right out the back of your house, there's a chance that that's being fed by the same system in the house, and it is not being fed uh, by what's being the irrigation system. So it's not the best, but here's just an example. Uh, my house, I did not have any sort of pressure reduction when I moved in and my pressure was up at 150 PSI, which is very high throughout the whole property. That is about three times the pressure that an irrigation system would want to run on. This will not work for any of the irrigation system approaches that we're talking about, or even normal old school irrigation. This is high enough that parts will fall apart and, and wear out prematurely. Uh, way too much pressure. The best way if you have an existing spray system before you get into it to test your pressure is to actually test your pressure at the spray. And so you can get a pressure tester where you unscrew the spray nozzle, and then whether it's a pop-up sprinkler or this is my pressure test after I installed my new irrigation system, uh, whether it's on a riser, basically you unscrew the nozzle, you screw this with this T part and the dial in and screw the nozzle back on and then you run it. And that shows the actual pressure where the sprinkler is running. And then you can see what you need to do for pressure reduction. And here are your main options for pressure reduction in order of what you might find. So if you are running drip irrigation system, no matter what your starting pressure is, whether it's already decent or not, you will want a pressure regulating filter, which is a piece that screws on after the valve, but before the rest of your pipe starts directly after the valve. And that can be added in. There's a whole video on the YouTube channel about kind of step-by-step step showing you how to do that. And that basically filters out any little grit in the line so it can't clog your drip emitters and brings the pressure right down to 30 to 40 PSI, which is the pressure range that drip systems are engineered to work on. If the pressure is higher, it's not gonna work right and parts can fall apart. And these, if your pressure coming into those valves is up to, they say 150 PSI by how these are engineered, these can handle it. If it's higher, you need something else. For me personally, I really, based on what I've seen uh, in landscapes, only feel comfortable with this approach and without any pressure reduction before the valve up to maybe about 100 PSI, maybe a little higher than that. I've had projects where things are like 130, 140, and there's still issues with the valves. If it's higher than 150 PSI, you need basically like one of these heavy duty whole house pressure reducers. So this is what I did on my property is, and this is something you might hire a plumber for because this goes on the always pressurized main line is I went to before the main line branches out to the irrigation system. And I installed one of these to bring the pressure down within kind of more of the operable range. And then I still have one of these after the valve. And then we're going to talk about a very simple drip retrofit kit later on, where you can just unscrew one of your sprinklers and potentially screw in this, which has the pressure reducer and the valve in it, but it just goes right where the sprinkler was. 
they're great for certain situations, but you already need to be within the range of relatively reasonable pressure because these smaller things are only designed to work up to 70 PSI. So if you have that 100 PSI, you're still gonna need to do something else before that to reduce the pressure through the whole system. High pressure is something that we commonly see when we're helping homeowners with their landscapes. Uh, be a problem that's unaddressed because it is kind of complicated. This is one of the more complicated concepts we'll talk about today. Uh, and so people just don't want to think about it, but we see lots of problems being caused by it. So that's why it's important. So generally, if your pressure is already down to 30 or 40 ish, if you have sprinklers, you don't need to do much about it. If you have drip, go with one of these options. And this is true for drip up to about 70 PSI and then up to 150 PSI. If your pressure is 45 to 100 ish, these are going to be your, your options. If your pressure is higher, you're going to want one of these and potentially also need one of the other options as well. And so that's pressure. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but it's important to think about if you have high pressure and don't just hope for the best, test your pressure because most people do have too high of a pressure to not put in at least that pressure reducing filter, which is absolutely essential for drip because you need the filtration as well. Got a quick drink of water. Okay, so now we are going to move from these concepts, pressure is essential for everything, to talking about if you want to stay with a spray irrigation system, here are a few essential concepts. Spray irrigation systems are designed to function and give even water with what's called head-to-head -head coverage or head-to-head -head spacing, which means that the spacing in between the individual sprinkler nozzles are supposed to be so that the stream of one sprinkler nozzle hits basically the center of the next sprinkler nozzle. And there's overlap between the sprinklers. That's how you get even watering with these. Occasionally we see sprinklers that have been installed where the edge of one stream is just spaced to do the edge, to hit the edge of the other stream. Because if you set it up like that, it looks like you need less sprinklers. And when you look at the surface of the soil, it looks like everything is getting wet. But what happens with this and without the overlap is that there's very wet zones and there's very dry zones. This is not how sprinklers are engineered to work. It's like you see on the top. And so from the bird's eye view, here's what you can see. This is kind of looks like a piece of abstract art, but to kind of explain that, you can see whether it's a corner that's spraying only like 90 degrees or along the edge that's spraying only 180 degrees or the center that's spraying in a full circle, everything is getting pretty close to hitting the next sprinkler close to it. And it's not gonna be perfect because the geometry just doesn't work out. But the closest you get to that, that's really how things are engineered to work. The other important concept is what's called match precipitation. And what that means is that you are installing your sprinkler nozzles and selecting your sprinkler nozzles to work as a set, meaning you're gonna wanna have it be generally all one model, all one brand. Oftentimes we see sprinkler nozzles that are kind of mixed and matched, one of this, one of that, one of this, one of that, in terms of different types. Sometimes some of them will be the high efficiency rotating and some will be the, the sprays. All of those sprinklers, depending on the model and the brand, are sometimes engineered to put out a different amount of water at a different rate. And so you'll have wet areas and dry areas. What you want is a set of sprinkler nozzles that are engineered and designed to work together. And that still can mean, and it will mean because the manufacturers provide the options. It'll be a combination of corners and ones that only spray 180 degrees, ones that are full circles, you have plenty to work with. A lot of them are also adjustable, so they can be notched down and open up a little bit. But for example, two of the common ones are of these high efficiency sprays are Hunter MP rotators, and then Rainbird has one, it's a different brand. That's a spray nozzle series, which is MPR, which stands, it doesn't matter what it stands for, but it, it's a similar one. But 
they're engineered very differently. So you can't mix and match them because the hunter ones, for example, put out water slower than the rainbird ones do. They're both great sprinklers, but you need to use only one as a complete set. And then with that, that will also eventually guide how long you water based on how long that set works. And so today in our examples, we'll use MP rotators. Uh, those are just the most common ones. And one of the reasons why I like MP rotators is part of their efficiency is that they put out water very slowly and they give the soil time to absorb that water. Whereas more traditional sprinklers put out water quicker and sometimes you get pooling and runoff. A nice thing about that in retrofit situations is that the MP rotator is always gonna be putting out less water than the nozzle it's replacing. And so if your sprinkler system was working okay in terms of the number of nozzles on a certain amount of pipe and all of that, you don't need to worry about any of the math, you'll be fine. And in pretty much all situations, if you need to add one or two sprinklers on, you'll be okay. And so we are not going to talk about all the math of adding up the number of sprinklers and the flow through each sprinkler because we're doing this as a retrofit. But if you want to look more in depth at the full process of how you would set up a sprinkler from scratch, we actually talk about the process of setting up a, a high efficiency spray system from scratch as part of the efficient watering for fruit trees and vegetable gardens workshop that we do. And so you could review that section on our uh, web page or sorry on our YouTube channel and that will give you the whole like detail of how to do all of that but for the retrofit like I just mentioned if you're going with those MP rotators you're generally going to be fine on having the same number or even a couple of extra sprinklers even if you need to kind of move where they are add one or two things because they put out less water total through that same pipe and so those are the main considerations and so for those of you who are feeling overwhelmed with the technical stuff right now, and that will be some of you, uh, bear with it. This is kind of concepts that are important. And then we will get into the kind of pictures of the systems going in and kind of showing kind of step-by-step -step sort of stuff, but you all have this con context. And so here are the essential concepts for drip now. These are the sorts of systems that I was talking about where in most cases you are asking for trouble. I understand that these are, are cheap and unintimidating to install. And if you've been successful with them, I'm not gonna tell you to change it. But what I will say is that we have a program for our local service area where we will go out and help people find leaks and advise on how to increase efficiency of irrigation systems. And we have literally never found one of these systems where we don't find a number of leaks, breaks, this is one that was a typical example. They, they did not do the proper pressure regulation. So it's, this is the worst we've ever seen. Uh, but these things pretty much always have issues and fall apart. They, they are just a little too convenient and a little too cheap to really uh, work long-term in general. And even if you are going to try to stick to one of these, like for example, if you have two of those little button emitters at the base of a tree, as that tree grows in to really water that wider root zone, here's what you would actually kind of need to do to appropriately water that root zone, even if you're not watering often, is you would need to add more and more of those, not only move those emitters out, but add more and more of them on to where eventually for like one tree, you would maybe have tons and tons of these emitters and nobody ever does that. I mean, that, that's just, that's not gonna happen. And so that's why the way to do it would be something like this, where the tree's roots could grow out and then it could get that water where it needs to. Depending on the area, the amount of coverage you need to do, the size of the area. Uh, at a smaller size, you can, when you connect to the underground line that's feeding it, the plastic PVC line, you can, in a smaller one, you can work with all of this basically half inch size emitter tube. And whether you do a more formal grid or you weave it around, you can connect it, that'll work. At a certain size, and I'll give you the guidelines later, you need what's called a header. So that's going to be a larger three quarter inch pipe that then feeds the individual lines. And then there's a manifold at the back that can collect it in the larger lines as well. And so that's just because that same concept, you can only fit a certain amount of water through a pipe. And so at a certain 
point for a larger area, you need to go to a larger pipe size. And so here is an example of what that would look like in person. The most common material to make that out of is just the normal PVC plastic that you would have run a normal sprinkler line with. And then there's adapters that will bring it over to the drip type of line. However, this really, really needs to remain buried. And sometimes with drip line, uh, this part wants to be closer to the surface. And it also requires gluing and all sorts of other things that homeowners are not always that comfortable doing. So what I recommend and what I actually really like to use is a different product called Blue Lock. That's spelled B-L-U-L-O-C-K. And that's this pipe. Normally it's blue. Here it's purple because this is an example from our WaterWise demonstration garden landscape, which uses recycled water, which needs to use purple pipe to identify it as recycled water. Normally it's blue though. And so here you can see our drip lines, which would normally be brown, but here they're purple. These are the half inch ones. But because this is a relatively large area, we needed to feed it by this larger header. And so this is three quarter inch pipe. And the way the blue lock works is it's only to be used after the valve. So it's not to take constant, constant pressure on the main line, but after the valve, you can use this. It comes in a tube. It's a not PVC, it's a polyethylene uh, kind of plastic. So similar to drip tubes, but it's bigger. It's, it's kind of more rigid. Uh, and then the fittings just have a little gasket and some metal teeth and you push them in. So there's no glues. You can test the system right away. It's just a waterproof seal. And if it's leaking, you just need to push it in a little bit harder. So it's a lot less intimidating to work with uh, for a homeowner or a hobbyist. I just like it because it's less toxic than the PVC. And it's you don't want to leave it in sun long-term, long-term, but PVC really can't see the light of day. And so I prefer it for uh, being on the surface like this if it's going to be covered. So like this, if it was PVC, would have needed to be trenched and buried. Here, it can just be buried in the mulch like the drip lines. And so here's another example for like an odd shaped area. This is a classic area where spray would be really hard to make work and not be sprayed on the sidewalk. And so here's a small enough area that we could do it all with just the, we didn't need a header with just the drip line and changing the spacing a little bit at the different edges to make it work with the shape. A concept for drip, which will get us into the question of how far apart should these be? Or if you look at all of the different ways you can order drip line, these individual emitters, you can get a tube of this drip line where there are different rates that these emitters put out water, the spacing down the line and the spacing in between the lines. Those are all things that are going to change depending on your situation. And the reason why is due to how soil absorbs water for different soil types. If you have sandy soil, like if you're in a valley bottom area or in many of like the foothill areas where it's a sandy or even gravelly soil, the same amount of water in all three of these is gonna perform different. In a sandy soil, the, the soil doesn't hold on to water very tightly. And so a certain amount of water is going to stay relatively narrow in a pattern and go deeper. In a loamy soil, which is a combination of sand, silt, and clay, it's going to be a little bit in between where it's going to go a little bit wide, wider than sand or gravel and not go quite as deep because the soil can hold on to more water. Clay holds on to water very tightly. And so in a clay soil, it also takes longer to soak in. So in a clay soil, it's the far other end where the, the water is going to spread out wider and not go as deep. And clay can actually hold more water within a foot of soil than sand can. And so with clay soil, when you water, you might need to water a little bit more, but you won't need to water as often. And so with that, then it sets up recommendations. So with a sandy or loamy soil, your drip lines are going to be a little bit closer together. And with the clay soil, they're going to be a little bit farther apart. With a sandy or loamy soil, you will typically have the actual individual emitters that you order uh, or that you buy that are inside that line. You'll get a line with emitters that put out water a little bit faster. And with clay soil, because it doesn't absorb as quickly, you'll put out uh, 
you'll put out line with emitters that put out water a little bit slower. And so all of these manufacturers who make this stuff provide recommendations. And this is another reason why I highly recommend you going to the irrigation supply store instead of just the big box hardware store. The people at the big box hardware store can't help you with this sort of stuff. Here are the guidelines, but if you're not clear on it as well, which is this is the first time you're hearing it, it might be true. You might not be totally confident when you go to buy your stuff. You can go to the landscape specialty supply store and say, I know I need to get the inline drip irrigation line. I have a pretty heavy clay soil that doesn't drain quickly, or I have a very gravelly soil that drains very, very quickly. And you can ask them for the recommendation, proper recommendation on the spacing and, and the flow rate, and they should be able to help you out. But so this is one of the common brands uh, of drip line is made by Rainbird, which is the brand. Uh, this is kind of the series. It's this stuff just as an example. And so here's what they tell you to do. If you have clay soil, more of an in-between loamy soil or sandy soil. Here's the emitter flow rate you should order. 0.9 around here, at least, is the one that's most commonly stocked in the store, and but they can order this other stuff for you. Sometimes they have the other ones as well. Here is the spacing they recommend down the length, and here is the spacing they recommend in terms of how far apart. And so around here in kind of valley bottom areas into the foothills, unless you have very heavy clay, typically, and this is what we do at the WaterWise Community Center, most typical in, in most landscapes if the soil is pretty well drained is you're gonna be using a 0 0.9 gallon per hour individual emitter. Spacing down the coil of the line, so that's already fused into the line, is gonna be a foot. And in most cases, if your soil is very gravelly or very sandy, you can do every foot. In most cases uh, with sandy soil, we will do a foot and a half apart every 18 inches. Some of you may or may not know what type of soil you have. Here is just a very, very simple guide. You can also look online. There are definitely YouTube videos based on feel or what it looks like to help. But basically with clay, if your soil is dry, it forms very hard clumps, almost impenetrable. And when it's damp, it's flexible. It can be molded into shapes. It acts like clay. And also like when it's a little, when it's wet, if you have very clay soil, you can smush it in your hands and it feels very slick. You don't feel a lot of grit. With loam, when it's dry, it forms a clump, but when you squeeze it, it breaks apart pretty easily. And when it's wet, it, it forms a lump you can kind of turn it into a ball, but if you squish that ball, you can feel that there's, there's a good amount of grit in it. If you really have it wet and you, you move it around in your hands, like you'll get a little bit of that clay film on your hand, but you can still feel some sandy grit inside of it. With sand, it's pretty sandy. And most sand type soil isn't true like beach sand, but when it's dry, it might clump just a little bit, but it's pretty quick to fall apart and get sandy in your hand. And when it's damp, it, you can make it into a ball, but if you kind of smush it a little bit, it mostly kind of still crumbles apart rather than hold it, holding together and squishing. So hopefully that helps. When it comes to the drip line, there are many brands that make good stuff. Just to keep it simple, as a general recommendation, the most common high quality choices are made by the brands Rainbird and Netafam. Uh, and here are the, the ones that they mention. You might see the term CV at the end of it. Some lines will have it and some lines will not. What CV stands for is check valve. And that is another even tinier little thing built into these emitters so that if your landscape is a little bit sloped, when the drip line turns off, all of the water doesn't slowly by gravity drain out from the lower points. And so if you have a completely flat space, you don't need to get the stuff with the check valve. But if your space is not completely flat, you might as well get it. It doesn't cost that much more uh, kind of error on getting it rather than not if there's some slope to your landscape. And then absolutely critical. All drip systems must have a pressure reducer and a filter. You can get those parts separate, a pressure reducer and a filter. 
But if you're getting your parts from local landscape specialty store, these days, the, the most common thing is to get a pressure regulating filter. So there's only one part. And that's what we were talking about here. Here's an example of where the filter is separate from the pressure regulator. If you go with that direction, uh, then the filter goes first, make sure that water is nice and clean, the pressure regulator goes afterwards. And for, if you get that Rainbird pressure regulating uh, filter, there's two of them. There's one with a red sticker and one with a yellow sticker. One of them regulates it to 40 PSI pounds per square inch pressure. The other one regulates it to 30 PSI. 30 PSI is kind of the sweet spot of where irrigation systems are designed for. However, if water needs to travel a long distance down the pipe before it actually gets to where that water is being applied, like on most properties, all the valves might be in one area. Uh, for example, all your valves might be in the front yard, but your water is actually being applied out in the backyard. As the water travels through that, due to friction in the pipe with the water traveling through it, lo loses a little bit of the pressure. So if your valve is close to the area where you're doing your drip irrigation, you can use that 30 PSI valve, uh, pressure regulating filter. But if it needs to travel quite a distance to get to where it's finally being used, go with that 40 PSI one. And that's just a general kind of guide to choosing those. And so some drip design notes based on most commonly what we see. For sandy or loamy soil, you use one foot spaced down the line drip, drip line with 0 0.9, some brands is one gallon per hour emitters. And when laying that out in general, the space between those lines is gonna be 18 inches. If you are using that off of a three quarter inch line header for a larger area, you can run approximately 800 linear feet of that drip line. If you're using only that half inch drip line, like you're not doing the separate header, but from the connection from one spot, maybe you capped all of your, where all of your sprinklers are being fed and you put the adapter in from one individual spot, you can do 248 linear feet of that drip line to stay within that maximum amount of water you'll want to put through the line. However, Something funny happens with the hydraulics is that if you make, instead of just sending lines out, if you make a complete loop, things even out a little bit and you can increase that capacity. So if you are using only that one half inch drip line and you do it in like a full area where you're creating a loop, like you might've noticed uh, in some of those small beds where there's kind of uh, continuous along the perimeter and then the lines fill in. And we'll look at examples of that. You can sneak a little bit more in. So if the pipe feeding that is a half inch PVC pipeline, you can go up to 313 linear feet. But if it's being fed by a three quarter inch pipe, and that's just what's underground. So if you're retrofitting your sprinkler system, you might need to dig down and check the size of the pipe, see if it's the littler pipe or the bigger pipe. And if it's the three quarter inch, you can actually go up to basically 500 linear feet. You kind of get to double it. So that, that helps quite a bit in terms of getting more line with fewer spaces that you are connecting. If you are using something different, so for example, if you have clay soil, you might be using an emitter that's either 0.4 gallons per hour or an emitter that's 0.25 gallons per hour. You can find guidelines or even ask for help at the irrigation supply store in terms of figuring that out. Just know you can put more line if you end up with heavier soil and you have emitters that put things out. Like with the clay soil, just for example, even if you have still every one foot down the line and you go down to like a 0.25 emitter, you can do, because it's putting out only the one quarter amount of water, like per hour, then you can do four times as much line. So that's just kind of a general example. And this is getting at, for those of you who do want to get technical, uh, those maximum flows, but basically here are the guidelines that you can use. And also again, the staff at the irrigation supply store can help you out. So this is just a reference. Don't worry about it unless you are a technical kind of minded person, in which case you can refer to this and use it how you want. So 
what we are going to do now is I think let's get through our first section of applying this to a real garden so we can get a little bit less conceptual, a little bit more into stuff that's going to let you sink your teeth into how to use this. Then we will take our break and continue on through. So we will first apply this to a real garden, which is my front yard, which was a kind of not very well set up, but existing typical turf irrigation system with sprinklers along the edge and one in the middle, about 1200 square foot front yard landscape area when I moved in. So here was the irrigation system in, or sorry, here was the, the landscape when it was freshly planted. And here's the landscape as it started to grow in and about a year later. And so this is what I am talking about with the spray system where here are the sprinklers on the solid risers throughout the landscape. Uh, but by the time the garden grows in, people don't really pay attention to them. So it, I don't worry about them being unsightly. Uh, the sprinklers are at the edge, but when you look at it, you see a garden. Here is when our perimeter hedge is starting to grow in, still pretty young. And so you can see here, sprinklers out at the edge of the garden. And so how would we actually plan for that? Well, here is, we don't need to get into the landscape plan, but just to look down on it, this is kind of the bird's eye view of that landscape. And the lawn came all the way up to here. This is just the mulch pathway, so we can get out of the car, pretty narrow driveway and walk along it. And here's where all of the original sprinklers were. There was a planting bed up against the house. So there are some areas that the sprinkler system did not hit. And here is roughly what that sprinkler system did. I kind of turned it on. I did that audit. And here's what I found. One, we had a funny little angle here and the sprinkler went way over into the driveway. This sprinkler went way over onto the sidewalk. And then we had some dry zones. And so here, other than the areas that didn't get hit at all, there, there was kind of a lack of overlap. There was probably a sprinkler kind of missing here. And so there was a few areas that were pretty dry. And so what I needed to do, I know, is to plan for a system that one, we didn't want to keep watering that mulch pathway. And we knew we were going to have those risers sticking up. So wanted that to be at the edge of the landscape. So it wasn't just stuff for our car doors to hit and walk through. So we're going to have to move some of those sprinklers. As we were doing that, there was opportunities to make it more efficient by just nudging some of the other ones here or there. With the sprinklers that we we're using, which were those MP rotator sprinklers, which are more adjustable than a typical sprinkler, uh, and putting them on those two foot solid risers, here's what we decided to do. So we have different ones to work with. And so for here, the original system had four sprinklers but we could go with three with a larger throw that would get farther into the landscape and help accommodate or get rid of some of those extra dry spots in between because these little ones just didn't go far enough into the landscape to get those areas. This sprinkler in the middle, I just moved just a little bit in more so that we're not watering the sidewalk as much. And then I was able to do little micro adjustments that you can do with the screwdriver on the sprinkler so that we really get even less overspray. Sometimes you end up with just a little bit when you have like a weird curve in a cul-de-sac landscape, but you do the very best you can. Definitely you can always make it so that it's not running way off into the street. And then from for here, for these ones that didn't accommodate this bed closer to the house, we moved the sprinkler locations, not right up against the house, but closer to where we didn't have large areas being blocked. One thing to note, though, is that even going into it, we knew, for example, like we were planting a hedge here. So for the first couple of years when the hedges were going to be low, these sprinklers would go over the top. But I knew that eventually, once this native hedge gets installed, I'm going to have to move these sprinklers to this side. By the time that happens, these hedges will be pretty tough native plants to where they can get most of their water either from the sprinkler on this side or also we set them up so they can go backwards just a little bit and that'll be enough to make it work. So we knew based on the landscape design that even though we were going to stay with spray, I didn't want to run all of that drip irrigation in the grid and use all of that plastic. 
I just wanted to have something simpler that would be easier to check in on and kind of make it rain. I knew I was still gonna to have to make some adjustments over time and we'll see kind of step-by-step step how to move those sprinklers. And you can do it without a lot of trenching. So measuring tools and layout. So if you are going to do this, you are going to want to, uh, for example, if you're using the MP rotators, which just as a default is, is what I would recommend, you can get the sheet either from the website or from the irrigation store that tells you here are the ones you can mix and match. They go different distances. They have adjustable different radiuses. And then you kind of want to get out into your landscape with the measuring tape. And what I like to do is use a cloth measuring tape, 100 foot one, and then a big uh, nail for landscaping projects. You can get it at the big box hardware store and then stick this big nail in with this thing where I'm thinking about putting a sprinkler and then pull it out and see what kind of arc and what kind of overlap I might have or need. And then you can get these cheap little flags and kind of test things out. If you already have a really good sprinkler system and you just need to get them higher, you might be able to skip all of that and just use things where they are. Occasionally people do have that. And so this is it when it's in approximately two and a half months. And then here are, like I mentioned, the adjustments that I know I would have to make. I forgot I had this on a different slide. So we knew that this was going to have to kind of move in from there. And I also needed to add another sprinkler, another, uh, another length of pipe on top of some of these to get them even a little bit higher as things grew in. But again, that's only once the landscape is getting tall. So that pipe kind of gets covered by the landscape. You don't really notice that much. So that being said, this is just an example of, there's no perfect irrigation system. Spray, you lose some efficiency because eventually, you know, things aren't perfectly, perfectly, perfectly even. Uh, even occasionally when there is a little bit of blockage, like as a shrub grows in, you know, you move things around, you do your best. The native and waterwise plants figure it out some. You do lose some efficiency by the design compared to drip where you would just have that perfect grid and water just all goes to the ground. However, with drip, you lose some efficiency because eventually there's leaks or clogs and you don't notice them right away. So again, it's what's gonna be best for you. So let's take a breath and then we will go through the same thing with the advantages and disadvantages and how we would lay out this exact same landscape that I showed you if I was going to do drip instead so you can see the different approaches. And then from there, we will loop back around and show the kind of step-by-step, -step, here's how you would actually put it together. But that comes kind of towards the end because you want to really have a good guidance in terms of what you would be putting together, what's going to work best for your landscape before then you, you, you know, spend time on that step-by-step, -step, how to put it together. Also, realistically, uh, I'm putting that towards the end because we will go through it, but the step-by-step -step how to put that stuff together is better to watch in the YouTube videos that we have where you can actually see that video up close, you know, some of it zooming in on my hands as I do it rather than uh, the slides. And so we'll go through that part, but there's lots of supplemental material where this part is really best explained kind of slowly step-by-step step, so you can figure out the best approach for you. So it is 1048 now, we still do have lots to cover. So we will restart this workshop at 1050. Four, 1055. Uh, some of you will be pretty intimidated right now. That's why this is a recording and you can rewatch it. The reality is that if you are going to put it in and do it right, there is some of this stuff to learn. And so I didn't want to oversimplify it and not set you up for success. That being said, I will have plenty of time for questions and answers, even to stay after 12. So if we need to refer back to slides, answer questions, clear things up, let me know. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, and then for some of you, you might be thinking, and wait till the end to really make your decision, you might be thinking this all just seems too complicated. 
And that, if you don't wanna learn the details of how to do this stuff for some of you might be true. So if you're thinking about a project, and I know it depends on your budget as well, it is not rare for people who we work with supporting them, our local community members in landscape transformation projects, taking out the lawn, putting in the new plants. Sometimes irrigation is what seems like the hardest part. So I, it's, not, not, it's not uncommon. It is very common for me to work with people who like they feel I will do the planting, I will do the mulching, but I am going to bring someone in. I will hire a landscaper to help me with the irrigation part of the project. And that's where I will spend my budget for like the help I'm bringing in, but I, I can handle the other stuff. If you are feeling like this is intimidating for you and you have the budget to accommodate it, sometimes that's not a bad way to go. But the landscaper, uh, might just kind of do what they always do. Some landscapers, when you ask them about, you know, the irrigation systems, they will just put in the button emitters because they are cheap and they are quick systems to put in. And so even if this is a little too complicated for you and you are going to work with a landscaper or contractor to do the irrigation, just for having gone through this workshop, you will have much more direction in terms of a recommended type of irrigation system to put in and the questions to ask to make sure you get a good irrigation system. So hopefully for those of you who are intimidated, that helps a little bit. I know I just ended up uh, talking quite a bit through part of our break time. So let's reset our clock for the break and we will start back up again at 10.57 and uh, type in any questions. And we will start with some Q&A and, and then we will go into drip and then loop back around to that very practical like step-by-step -step assembly. All right, talk to you all soon.
Okay, we are back. Uh, I didn't see any questions come in. So if you have questions, type them in. Uh, if it's just general, like this is unclear, let me know. Uh, hopefully this is working for you. If, <laughs> guess if you're still here, it's working, but I, I would have expected more questions. So yeah, let me know, don't hesitate, uh, but maybe we'll get more questions as it all kind of loops around and comes together. Uh, so this is a basic large drip system layout for a large area with a header. And so what we will do is we'll look at a couple of examples and then how things would go together for that same front yard, either with a like single large drip zone with the header or with using those little adapters that just replace individual sprinklers. And so this was here at the Waterwise Community Center. Uh, and this is the area that it ended up irrigating, which small here, but are growing into be kind of a large shrub demonstration of different native plants you can use in mixed hedges. So if we were going to do something like that for this same irrigation system, what we would do is we would go back to where the valves are and our existing valves are here. So if the valve was in good condition, a relatively modern valve, not like an old brass one or old one that you turn with the sprinkler key, then what you could do is you can, at, right after that valve, you would dig up some, you would cut the pipe and I have a whole video about how to do this. And then you would put in that pressure regulating filter from there, you can potentially reconnect to some of the existing buried line. And so for example, for me, this would be this existing buried line uh, goes underneath a gate and comes out and must go this way in order to feed the first sprinkler. So you can use some of that potentially. If it's easier, you can just redo that. And then you would get to a point where you either connect to the existing line or where your drip starts. And then you would build your header. So this is sometimes called the supply header because it's what's supplying the water. Because the nice thing with drip systems is that you don't need to have the pipe go all the way around. All you need to do is get it to the supply. So what you would do is you would go to here and then you would connect and then you would build that part that I showed you with the three quarter inch line and the adapters that go to the individual drip lines. And then each line at your spacing, so for this soil type, it would be 18 inches approximately. The line just runs clear across the landscape because it was pretty well gardened area. There's a little walkable kind of ground cover area here. So there's not big pathways and it just goes across and then it all goes into an exhaust header, which is built the same way with the three quarter inch pipe and adapters, but it doesn't need to connect back into anything. It just kind of evens out the water flow on the side. And so what you would do is one of two things, if you were to set this up, you could either just use the valve and abandon the old line so you can cut it out, not worry about it. You can unscrew the sprinklers if you want, kind of bury the old line and run from here. Or if you use part of the existing buried line, you would just wanna go back and make sure you cap all of the old sprinklers. And we will show the easy way to do that later on so that the water is not also trying to come out of the sprinklers if you're still tapped into that line. And so that is basically that approach. Uh, in terms of the math of how large of an area you can do with this, it conveniently works out that like if you have a large front yard, you might have two or three different valves that do different parts of your spray system. If you have a relatively modestly sized front yard like mine or smaller, there might be only one valve that does the spray system. If you have an area where one valve does a spray for a certain area, normally that's all you're going to need in terms of being able to also supply water to that same area with a drip line connected to that same valve. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, okay, so Tim has an old galvanized irrigation system. How to evaluate whether it needs is sufficient or needs to be replaced. PVC has been used been being used long enough. So your house was built in the 40s. That most I have I have never seen a galvanized system in my time doing landscaping that is not so corroded on the inside that it can be reused. So and yeah, so so I will I will say that in my experience a galvanized system should always be replaced with PVC from scratch because normally they're either overdue for being replaced or are so close to the end of their life that it's not worth doing any additional work on them. Uh, you might lose everything that you had put into it when, when it gives out. And also uh, like cutting PVC, existing PVC is easy to cut into and glue onto. Because even if the PVC is like 15, 20 years old, uh, it stays well preserved once it's under soil. It doesn't do well out in the sun, but once it's under soil, it stays well preserved and it's easy to cut and uh, connect to. Galvanized is the opposite. It is a nightmare to take old galvanized and reconnect into it. And that's so prone to leaking that if you have galvanized, just, just go with PVC. Uh, Okay, so from Christine, I have an existing drip irrigation line set up with the plug and play options you mentioned you didn't like. Could I use the existing half inch tubing to connect new emitter tubing in? Absolutely. So if you have existing half inch tubing, uh, you can. And remember that the amount of uh, length that you would be able to connect off of that half inch tubing is going to be less than if you were being fed by a, a three quarter inch pipe. But if you connect into like the existing, like if at one point in time you connected into three quarter inch pipe in a couple of places, you might be fine. So compared to the little button emitter systems, these drip grid systems are going to put out significantly more water like over the course of an hour. Uh, so you have to pay a little bit of attention to that. But in terms of the technical thing of like connecting one line type to the other and like using those little plugs to plug up the, the areas that used to connect to the little buttons, no problem at all. And so, and I will provide you some guidance with how much you can do off the half inch line in the next one when we talk about the adapters. There'll be some stuff relevant. So thanks for the question. I'll, I'll talk in the next section about how that might be relevant for your situation. Uh, Okay, and so from here, so just as an example of how much line you can do, uh, off of with the, the typical uh, gallons per hour and the way that the most common drip line is specified, off of this three quarter inch supply line, also from the three quarter inch valve, you can normally run up to 800 linear feet of drip. Uh, for example, for my 1200 square foot front yard, I needed, would have needed for this design 748 linear feet. So you can use that also as just a general guide, uh, three quarter of an inch with this setup would cover roughly 1200 square feet, a little bit more, 1300 square feet of uh, landscape area. Other couple of quick notes about drip. If you have something where it's a little bit more sparsely planted, like for example, this is a section in our garden where we just have some fruit trees, you wanna make sure you kind of do the, the drip line and a bit underneath the canopy area. But if there's open areas in between, you don't necessarily always need to do a square grid all the way down. So this would be an example of connecting into a solid line here. There's only a few trees, so it's just a half inch feeder. And then you can do something like this. So that's something that's nicely flexible about drip line. Disadvantage of drip line is, here's an example. We have a lot of, because there's a kind of open area next to our headquarters, a lot of squirrels and some ground squirrels, which can be particularly problematic. And so here's an example inside of an existing shrub where we have drip lines and the squirrels were chewing on it. And it was just kind of a pain to get in there and find the leak. We heard the leak and saw puddling, but it was kind of a pain to get in there. 
and find that leak and plug it up. Uh, in a very urban area, you don't have as much of a problem with critters chewing on things, but for whatever reason, if there is a leak, you know, it, it's harder to deal with than a spray system. So advantages, nothing will ever be blocked and you won't need to do any replacements or digging because of that. The weighing kind of disadvantage is that when there are repairs, it, it kind of is less accessible and you need to do some work to get there. Okay. Let's take a breath. We are getting through it and we are going to before long be getting to the part where it's less kind of mathy technical stuff and more just here's how to put the parts together. Uh, so the last thing we are going to talk about is if you want to do a drip conversion where instead of going back to the main line, you're going to use this adapter kit. And so this is something that's the spray to drip conversion kit made by Rainbird. And it looks like a sprinkler because it's meant to replace the sprinkler, but adapt it to drip irrigation. And if you are using a Rainbird brand sprinkler, you don't even need to unscrew the entire sprinkler itself because just the guts can come out and then just the top and the internal mechanisms can replace it. And so here's an example from an, a conversion that we did at our facility an area that we decided would be better off on drip than it was on spray. So you would unscrew the top carefully and pull the guts out. This happened to be a 12 inch tall spray because it was already doing a landscape area and not a lawn. And so when you do a lawn sprinkler, uh, it's gonna be much less long. You won't pull out quite as much guts, but it'll look pretty similar. And then what you're gonna do is unscrew the this part, if you have that Rainbird brand. If you don't have the Rainbird brand sprinklers, you would unscrew the whole body, uh, dig a hole, unscrew the whole body to make sure when you unscrew it, you don't get dirt in there and just kind of screw this whole thing on like you're replacing the sprinkler. But here's what it looks like inside. There is a filter, there's a tiny pressure reducer, and then there's the adapter that gets you onto your kind of drip line. And so you would screw that in and then start running your drip line right from there. Important thing is, you want to, eventually you're gonna mulch your landscape, your plants are gonna grow in, and you are going to put caps on the rest of the sprinklers. You want to do something to mark where this is, whether it's a garden ornament, whether it's a particular stone, and you're gonna remember like next to that stone is where this is, because I have talked to a number of people who have taken this approach, and over time, this gets buried in mulch, which is fine. And you want to check and just with like a hose flush out any grit that is stuck within this filter, ideally every six months, at least every year. Uh, our city water is pretty clean, but sometimes if there's work on like main lines in the city water distribution system, there's some grit that gets into it. And so eventually that will need to be flushed out. And so what sometimes happens is if you splice in, which is more work to do, the filter at the valve, that's going to be above ground and it's you'll never forget where that filter is. But I've definitely talked to people who say they did the drip conversion and things were working great for a while and now it's been like four or five years and the drip system is not working. And I asked them when the last time they flushed their filter out was and they never have. And I asked them if they remember where it even is five years later, and they have no clue and it's buried in the mulch somewhere. So remember, do something, remember where this is, check and flush your filter every six months or so. And then just the other note is, uh, they also have, if you just need to send it off in one direction, there's different adapters that you can screw onto here that go in different directions as well. And so here's what this same area would look like if you were going to then use these things instead of doing the manifold or the header at each end and the, and the pressure reducer filter at the valve. Here, you would cap off all of the sprinklers except for two because this area is a little too big than the flow capacity of just one of these. 
And so you would do two, you would mark where they are. I tend to choose ones that are just kind of centered in the area. And then you would install a grid that goes in a loop that then goes back to each one of these. You would also put what are called flush valves at the end. And I will show you what those are. And that's basically if any grit does get into the drip system, it's just something that you can quickly open up and every once in a while, and especially the first time you turn it on, if any dirt got in the lines, let clear water run through before you close it. And then the system pressurizes and forces water out through those little drip emitters. So that is basically how this option would work. Remember that you can fit because oftentimes if you're not going to dig up, you will want to assume that this is just being fed by a half inch PVC line, might be fed by a three quarter inch, might be fed by a half inch in the sprinkler system. Uh, if you're not going to dig down and start sizing pipe, err on the side of caution, assume it's half inch. And so remember that's going to be 248 linear feet, what I mentioned before, or it can go up to about 330 linear feet. And then if you confirm that it's actually connected to a three quarter inch, you can go up to close to 500 feet. And so that gets through the real, real technical part. Uh, now we are going to spend most of the rest of our time looking at kind of the step-by-step -step through the systems. And then we'll talk just a little bit about timing, but mostly I will, rep I will connect this to uh, the online resources that we have, which has a lot more uh, information about how, once you have the system built to decide how long to run your system for. Did see a question come in? Yes, this is being recorded and there is an older version of this workshop, same content, but what I taught uh, last year on the YouTube page that we have for our workshop recordings right now. Uh, so question from Mark who had to step away during the break. Can you mix drip and sprinklers in the same sprinkler zone? No, you cannot because the rate that they put out water, like you can co physically connect the pipes, but you never want to because the rate that they put out water is going to be different. So when it comes to deciding how long to run your system for, uh, it's not going to be well matched. So normally it's going to be, or what you want is one valve would run drip, one valve would run spray if you need to. Okay, so here I'm going to show you the build out of my front yard, converting to those high efficiency sprays on the solid risers to project over the plants. And so some parts we are going to need are, we are going to reuse all the underground pipe, but we are going to need the two foot solid pipe risers, stabilizing it with two foot lengths of rebar, which you can get from the hardware store or the irrigation supply store. And to hit that rebar in, this is a four pound sledgehammer, which you can get hardware store. To connect that rebar, which stabilizes the sprinkler riser to the sprinkler riser, we are going to use these stainless steel clamps, which you can get usually in the plumbing section of the hardware store. You can also get them at the irrigation supply store. And then you slide them over and then you just use a screwdriver to twist these down. Uh, you can do it with zip ties if you're trying to do it cheaper, but the zip ties, even the UV resistant ones only last a year or two, and then eventually they fall off. So this is a more long-term solution. We will need thread seal tape. This is the tape that you're sometimes called plumber's tape that you use for connections that you screw together, makes them watertight. And a trenching shovel. If you don't have a trenching shovel, you can use a normal spade kind of shovel. But if you are going to be doing any trenching at all, in this case, we were doing just a little bit and digging up around your sprinklers, uh, you can dig a smaller hole if you have a smaller width of a shovel. And so here is, if you are going to be leaving your sprinkler in the exact same place, because the sprinkler can stay where it is, has a good distribution, it's in a good spot, here is what you would do. You would dig it up around it. Sprinklers that are well installed will not be directly, directly connected right into the PVC plastic line, but will be on what's called a swing joint which when you unscrew, this is a material, pipe material that's a little bit flexible. 
And then it connects to this threaded plumbing piece and it could rotate in there a little bit. And so it's called a swing joint because it can swing around. And that's basically like if somebody steps on it uh, or if it's like along the edge of a driveway and a car goes over it, there it's not putting the pressure directly on the pipe and breaking it. So hopefully, and if you have a irrigation system that was stalled in the 90s, 2000s, you will probably have this. If it's older, you might not. Uh, but it, even if the pipe is directly there and you don't want to install this, you can do that. This is just the swing joint is, is commonly what you see and what we had here. And so then onto that swing joint, you will put some of that thread seal tape, uh, spin it around three times, three layers is what you will have. And I, and I talk about that process and really show it. There's a video of this whole process on our YouTube page. So I'm gonna go over this kind of quickly, but all of those little details of like, how do I do the thread seal tape are there on that YouTube video. Then there's an adapter that's, female thread and female thread because we're putting it our riser on, which is also a male thread. So we need to be able to connect those two. Thread seal tape on that as well. Screw that in. That's what we have. Then we're gonna to need to secure this because this is kind of floppy in the landscape and we wanna make sure it's secure and the sprinkler is gonna spray in the right direction. So being careful, you're going to want to dig down a little bit and make sure you know that your sprinkler line is not right underneath where you're going to be hammering this in. So dig down some, make sure you know that you're not hammering this right into the main uh, part of the sprinkler line. And then you're going to hammer that in, ideally about a foot down. And then you're going to connect that clamp. And there you go. And then you would put your adapter and nozzle on after you flush your system. So we're going to show... Uh, setting these up, then we're going to show flushing the system, then we're going to show the adapter and the uh, nozzle going on. But in some cases, you're going to have to move a sprinkler. And so this is a case, so this is the edge of my asphalt driveway. This is the mulch area that we're going to leave open to be able to be like a little informal walkway. And I know that I need to move this sprinkler from here two over here. So from the green flag to the white flag. So here's that process. It's a little bit more involved, but not that complicated. So dig out around the sprinkler, remove this sprinkler. That's just cleaning it off because there's some dirt on the threads. Thread seal tape goes on again. You're gonna to wanna to make your hole big enough that you can work down in that hole without getting dirt all over everything. That's ready to go. And then instead of just that female to female adapter where the riser is gonna go right on top of it, we would screw in a different adapter that goes from the female to this, what's called Rainbird swing pipe. And that is basically, you saw that flexible black pipe that was on that swing joint. You can get a hundred foot roll of that stuff either at Home Depot or at the Landscape Specialty Supply Store, as well as these adapters. And so you would screw that on. And then instead of having to do a bunch of trenching and gluing into the PVC and all of that to move a sprinkler head to a new location, you can have that adapter. We're gonna be heading to where this white flag is. Here with this swing pipeline, I just kind of run it like I would drip, like right on the soil surface buried in the mulch. It's not bad. In fact, it'd be good if you were gonna trench all the way into the soil, you can absolutely do that. I was trying to do a lot of stuff on a quick amount of time at the time. So I just ran it in the mulch and that's been fine. So this is what this stuff is. It's Rainbird swing pipe, hundred feet of it. And that's a flexible, but very solid pipe. So you can bend it in different directions. Doesn't need to be a, an exact angle. Uh, like with the PVC pipe, it's a lot more flexible and no gluing, just screws on. Tip, if you're working, whether it's with drip line or this stuff, any sort of pipe that comes in a roll that has the shrink wrap on the outside or saran wrap on the outside, don't take this all off. What you want to do is there's going to be four bands usually on the inside that are holding it together. Cut those and uncoil your pipe from the inside. That holds together the pipe from uncoiling and tangling on the outside. 
So that's just kind of a tip that will make your life easier. You're going to cut this with a, it's called a poly pipe cutter. It's the same cutter that you could use either for drip line or for if you're doing like PEX piping, you can get the hardware store, the landscape supply store. Or if you're just doing a couple of these cuts and you have a very sharp hand pruners, like a garden shears, you can use that as well to cut it. So there you go. Gonna measure out how long of a piece you need and then cut that piece to size. And then if you are doing like a 10 foot run, like we were here, it's a little bit awkward because what you do is you kind of push and you just twist that on. So this is often a two person job if you have a really long piece. And so my partner who was taking a picture of me doing this, actually when I screwed this on, she kind of held the top so it didn't flop all around and helped me as I then kind of twisted this on to the fitting at the base. And so you can see here, it's kind of a spiral. And so sometimes these fittings are called spiral barb fittings because you push it in and you twist it together. And it is doable with one person, but easier with two if you have a long length, easy to do if you have a shorter length with one person, then that just flexes and goes to the location where the sprinkler needs to be. And then you add another one of these adapters on this side. And then it's the same process. Thread seal tape on the riser, screw that together, rebar, clamp. Once you have all of those together, before you put on your sprinkler nozzles, because even if you try to do a good job of not getting dirt into the pipe, inevitably some gets in there, you don't want that to clog your sprinklers, you then flush your line. So basically you turn on the water to them and you let it run for, you know, 30 seconds, a minute or so out of the risers. Now, because that's going to allow a lot of water to go out, most of the time, water is not going to gush out of all of them at once. It might gush out of three, four, five of them, depending on your landscape. And so keep an eye on which ones have flushed that clean water out from it. And then you'll turn off your water. And then you will put the sprinklers on that you can of the ones that have been flushed. And then if you need to turn it on again and make water gush out of the rest of them, you can. So sometimes it'll take, depending on your site, you know, three or four rounds of flushing, putting some sprinklers on, and then that lets more water flow through elsewhere in the system and then put more sprinklers on. And so when it comes to it, you're gonna take this, always with your thread seal tape. You're gonna do, this is called a shrub head adapter. So it gets from the bigger pipe thread to the smaller pipe thread that your irrigation nozzles will screw onto. And then you just screw your nozzles on, and then you're gonna have to adjust your nozzles, which for a lot of them, uh, there's a little tool. So just for the MP rotators, for example, uh, you don't need the tool. You can use a little screwdriver in your hands, but the little tool makes it easy. You can adjust, they have an adjustment for how the radius goes and it's adjustable. The small ones go from 90 degrees, like a corner to a little over a half spray to a 210 degree. If you need a full circle, that's a separate one. And then for very small angles, they make a separate one as well. And then you can also, so you use the ring that this goes over to adjust the radius. And then you can also, to some degree, adjust the, the throw you can't bring it way in. And so there's different models depending on how far you need it to spray. All the way from the smallest one will go about 12, 14 feet to the biggest one will go almost up to 30, which you normally won't need in residential situations. Uh, and you can adjust them about 25% down. And there's a little kind of like a mini flathead screwdriver built into the tip of this that you can then push down and screw to adjust. And so you adjust them all the best you can to make sure that uh, there's no overspray onto your sidewalk or your street or onto your neighbor's car. Everything's twist them to make sure everything's faced in the right direction. And there you go. So this is it kind of immediately after completion. And this is it as things are growing in a little bit. And then as things grew in more, in some areas, we had, had to add on another length of pipe. And so in some areas where I knew that things were really gonna need to get tall, what I did is I unscrewed the shrub head adapter and that nozzle, and I actually put on 
a 12 inch pop-up sprinkler body. So where the sprinkler body itself raises up about another 12 inches. And then when the sprinkler pops up, it goes another 12 inches to really go above the landscape, but then it goes back down. And that all of that is just on top of the riser above the soil. And in another area to get over this shrub growing in, you can see here's how it was originally. And then here's, I just added another, uh, I think one foot or 18 inch riser and then put the shrub head adapter back on. So that was last year. This year, these are starting to grow in even more. And pretty soon I'm actually going to do the same process of using that flex pipe, bringing it to the other side of the shrub and having the spray be over there. So again, advantage, uh, cheaper than drip. Uh, you get to see everything that's going on, but the disadvantage is that you do have to do some modifications over time to as things grow in to make sure that the sprays aren't being blocked. So now, and, and that's, that's basically all it is for adapting the, uh, the sprays. And again, there's a, a supplemental video that shows kind of my hands putting together one example of that in the first part of it. So for drip, there's more pieces to be involved. And so we will talk about them and then I will show you kind of the step-by-step -step. and there's a very extensive video showing step-by-step -step putting this together. So for the drip, you have your drip line. We talked about how to figure out which drip line to use. Uh, you're going to want to, even if you have a large project for homeowner projects, if you are going to be laying out the drip line yourself, doing all the work yourself, even if you need to get a bunch of 100 foot rolls, get 100 foot rolls. If you are going to be working with one other person and you would rather, you can get 500 foot rolls. I don't think you really save much money between ordering the 100 and the 500 foot because the 500 foot rolls, it's gonna be easier for one person to be kind of holding the, the roll, unrolling and the other person to be kind of taking the line off. And then they do make thousand foot rolls and if you do a full front yard and a backyard for a suburban property, you will use over a thousand feet of drip line. Uh, but the thousand foot rolls are more for commercial jobs and they have a specific like reel that they will load that onto to make it manageable to unroll off that thousand foot roll. Uh, you do not want to mess with the 1000 foot roll. That's just a big pain if you don't have that real system. So you can have that. You might have that spray to drip retrofit kit. In this example, we will use that. You're going to have what are called drip staples, which are these metal hoops that will push down into the soil over the drip line to prevent it from moving around on the soil surface. And then you're going to have your fittings and these come in elbows and T's are the main ones that you will use. Uh, if you have a break in your drip line, then make them that are just a coupler. And that's what you use if you need to cut out a piece or if there's a tear. And although there are many brands that make these, for homeowners, I am partial to recommending the Rainbird brand because the Rainbird brand has this special system where you can kind of see this bigger ridge, these kind of hoops that are around the fittings. Those are made so that they can clip into this tool. And then you can use this tool to push these fittings into the line because it does take a little bit of elbow grease to do it. And you kind of push them and wiggle them on. And this tool just gives you more leverage. And then this actual piece can actually be used to, uh, it's really a finger grip, but it can be used to stick into and loosen the drip line where this is gonna push in a little bit. So it makes it just a little bit easier for someone who doesn't do this all the time to put it together. It just makes it easier in general. We use these at our facility as well. Uh, Quick tip as well is for working with this drip line, leave it out in the sun for a couple of hours before you're working with this stuff. If it's warmer, these are easy to easier to push in. Or I've heard of some people actually bringing out a hairdryer on an extension cord and hitting it for a couple of seconds uh, to warm it up quickly before inserting these. And then finally, I talked about a flush valve. That's another thing that just inserts and it twists to open the flow and twists to close the flow. So most of the time the flow is closed twist to open it if you're gonna kind of make it flush. And so here's what we are going to build. This was an area that was on spray, small area in our demonstration garden, which is a nice contained area to show this. And we are gonna show capping all of the rest of these and then inserting this adapter here 
to run this small drip system. And so these are all screenshots, again, from that YouTube video. And I will show you as soon as we get through this, where to find that YouTube video online, make sure you know where to get it. And so like we mentioned before, starting by taking the guts out of the sprinkler, because it was a Rainbird brand one, if not, you would unscrew it and put the body on. Putting in the uh, adapter, a little thread seal tape, and then the adapter on top. And then measuring our spacing down at either end. And so we were doing that typical 18 inch spacing in between our drip lines. And what I like to use, because I always have on hand when I'm putting out drip line, a whole bag full of those drip staples, I will also use them as temporary markers to line up my drip. And so this is me measuring. If you have a paved edge or a hard edge of your landscape, you don't want to have a drip line right up against it. It'll just kind of get water to pool there. And, and if depending on if the slope is up a little bit, it'll just go off into the pavement. And so four to six inches away from edges is where you want to start. And so measuring that out and then measuring every 18 inch and just marking it temporarily with these drip staples, then cutting the inside of that roll and then using this tool to loosen things up a little bit and then insert it, rolling down to the edge cutting, inserting our elbow. Because it's a small area, we didn't need a header. We're going all with this uh, half inch drip line, rolling it down to the edge. And what I do is I roll out this whole edge first, and then I cut back in and put my T's in where I want each other line to go. Technically, if you have a large area, you might do this part. You can get a roll of just blank line with no emitters into it. But realistically, if you're doing small areas, it, it doesn't hurt to have a couple of other emitters that just randomly show up along here. And so sometimes we'll just use all the same material, which is what we did here. And so then splicing in the T's. And as you go, you're going to want to start securing things. When I'm putting in tees that I'm going to have to go in two different directions and come back to later, what I do is because the fittings can twist a little bit, I make sure I twist them up so that it's not sitting down into the dirt, which will eventually get dirt into the line. And so installing all of those, continuing the loop all the way around and installing those where they were marked on the other side. And then it's a matter of connecting them. One trick though, to get the most even distribution is you can see here, you have your one foot spacing on your, down your drip lines of your emitters. So we have one here and one here. When you run the line next to it, you want to set things up. So you're spacing. So it's what's called triangulating or staggering so that your emitters on the next row are roughly in between. So we have here, here, and here it forms a triangle. And then the next one, because it's a regular spacing down the line, will automatically be lined up. And so what I do is I kind of put it down and I see, and sometimes I need to clip the line a little bit to make it all line up nicely. And that just gives you the best distribution of water. If you have a weird like arc or curved shaped bed, you're not going to be able to get that perfectly, but just do your best. And then roughly across from where the water is fed from, kind of on the farthest point, you'll splice in a T, the little length, and then put your flush valve in. So this one has a gray back. The other one had a green back in the picture I showed. It might look like either. And then remember to have that flush valve in the open position the first time you turn it on. And so with those valves, the open position is the top piece running along the length of the line. The closed piece is if it's running across the line. And then we're gonna cap all the rest of the sprinklers. And so for that process, the easiest thing to do is you can get a cap that's meant to match the thread pattern that's gonna work for whatever manufacturer of your sprinkler. So these had Rainbird sprinklers. Uh, we got Rainbird brand ones. I think some of them, you can get them from the irrigation supply store. If you tell the irrigation supply store the brand of sprinkler, they will be able to advise you on to the right size. And I think they have some that are even universal ones but you can't go wrong with sticking with the same manufacturer. And so you're gonna unscrew it. You're gonna pull out the guts of the sprinkler. The sprinkler, the cap 
come with the plastic piece and then this little rubber gasket. And you're gonna need to make sure there's a little channel in there that you fit that down in there because that's what makes the watertight steel. If you skip that part, these will leak. And then you screw it on just hand tight. And when you turn your system on and run it for the first time, just check and make sure that they're not leaking. They usually don't. The other alternative is you can actually dig down, take these all the way out and use just a smaller PVC plug to screw in or a cap to screw in uh, underneath the ground and really permanently cap that off. That just requires more work. Most homeowners are gonna do this. Uh, either way is just fine. And then if you have the liberty of having an existing system, you might consider taking one of these sprinklers and instead of capping it, installing what's called a tattletail. And what that is, is you would unscrew the nozzle you can get it from the irrigation supply store. And if you tell them you're trying to you know, change a sprinkler over to pop up and be a tattletale uh, for when your drip irrigation system is running, they will know how to help you out usually. And so you unscrew your, unscrew your nozzle and you put on a little adapter. It's kind of the reverse of the shrub head adapters. You put on a little adapter that will screw in like it was a nozzle, but on the other side, it's just a half inch pipe thread and onto that, you put your tape and you put your pipe, uh, your half inch cap that just threads onto it. So it doesn't let any water come through. And so what happens is when your sprinkler system turns on or your, your drip system turns on, because it's capped, when this pressurizes, it just pops this up and it's an indicator that the system is on. And that's useful because if for some reason something's wrong with your timer and it's running when it's not supposed to be or gets stuck on or your valve gets stuck with a drip system, you might not notice for a long time. And so with this indicator that this is continuously running, you'll notice it and you'll know to check. And then finally, the last thing that we do is you would then refine the spacing. And so if I am doing a very large drip grid where I don't wanna measure out each of these, and then also to then get the final spacing in between all of these, make sure it's even before putting down the staples, I'll take a piece of pipe, you can do a stick, whatever, and I will measure it out. So for here, my spacing is 18 inches. I'll just measure it to 18 inches and cut it. And so instead of using the measuring tape all the time, that's just my handy indicator. And then I will kind of true everything up to being 18 inches apart or as close as possible as I put down these staples. Uh, normally you're gonna put these staples down to secure this in place every three to four feet. Uh, so you do go through quite a lot of them, but it's worth it because over time they will kind of migrate back and forth in the landscape. Uh, basically it, it kind of magically happens as the plastic heats up and cools down even if it's under mulch. And so that just holds them all in place. And then the first time you turn it on, you do it with the flush valve open, let water go through for a minute or two, close it out, and then there you go, starting to work. So let's see if he, we have any questions. Uh, so new questions is, okay, from, from Mark, how high can you run up the sprays? Oh, so that was from the spray. You know, that's gonna depend on the dynamics of your water pressure. Uh, all I know is even with pressure regulation, like in my yard at, uh, and also like if you're having to go uphill, things like that. So in my yard, uh, my sprinklers are just slightly, slightly uphill of where my valve is. And I have some that have, uh, two feet of pipe plus uh, 18 inches of sprinkler body and then plus another foot of sprinkler uh, when it's going and they run absolutely just fine. Uh, I have seen like people in orchard situations, which is not what I would recommend that have like five feet of pipe and then literally something that makes it rain and they work. Uh, but yeah, it, it kind of depends, but I've not had a problem with getting them up like within the range of what I am showing. And then from Christine, uh, how do I know if I should buy six inch or 12 inch drip line? I assume that you mean the spacing in between the emitters. 
Uh, if not, let me know. So 12 inches is the closest for like a landscape type drip that you'll find. And then for heavier clay soil, uh, it might be 18 or even 24 inches. 12 inches is really standard. If you have very heavy clay soil, uh, you might go to like an 18 inch spacing. Uh, normally, like within what I see in Southern California, we don't have like super heavy, heavy soils to where you'd go for 24 inch, because even if you have an 18 inch spacing, you can space the lines farther apart. Uh, so normally it's going to be 12 inches, or if you have very heavy clay soil, 18 inches. Okay. And then finally, just to cover it, uh, and also this is covered in the video. If you do need to install a header type system for a larger area, it's going to be a little bit more complicated, but what you would have to do is you'd have to dig and find the PVC main line or go all the way back to the valve here again, purple pipe, because we're working on recycled water. If you don't want to do PVC gluing, you can like the blue lock, there's a product called PVC lock, which is just a compression fitting. So you push it together. You wouldn't ever use this on the main line, always under pressure, but after the valve, it's fine. And so you might need to have some, some little bit of moving the pipe around to get it where you want it to be, which is what we were doing here in this example. And then if you're going to be using PVC all the way, you can keep using this stuff. If you're going to be using blue lock, like we're showing in this, which is the non PVC stuff that, that I like to use, then there'll be an adapter where you screw in to the thread. Uh, so you have a threaded adapter, a threaded adapter, and then you go into the PVC lock system. And I'm going through this pretty quickly, but I explain it in more detail in the video. I just want to give you the sense of what you're going to be getting into. Quick note on blue lock is you can't go into just any uh, landscape supply store and find it. Ewing sometimes carries it, which is the name of one landscape supply stores, but it's very easy to order online. There's a few places. Drip Depot is the name of a place where I've ordered it from before. Uh, they have free shipping, so it doesn't necessarily cost you more, and you can get all of the adapters and the pipe and that sort of stuff. Uh, you see in this video, there's, uh, or in this video and in this uh, demonstration, there is fittings. Uh, there are fittings where there's blue plastic and there are fittings where there's black. Black is just, they changed the manufacturing and actually improved them a little bit. So I had old stock of the blue ones and the new ones are the black ones. So they're the, they serve the same function. So don't worry about the color there. Uh, the white ones like this are for PVC, but the black and blue ones are for the blue lock. And so here it's just, it's the same idea. We just have the larger pipe and the push to fit fittings, but we're still doing the exact same thing. 18 inch spacing, measuring out on one side. We will do a larger flush off of the three quarters, but it's still a flush. It's just larger pieces from the landscape supply store. And then it goes together in the exact same way. So everything is the same. It's just that if we are putting more water through, you're doing a larger pipe, whether it's the blue lock or the PVC at one end. Uh, Okay, so a couple of questions on that, and then we will cover the adding the pressure regulating filter if you need to. So from Mark, so in there, the drip was below the cement work. I'm gonna do in the area between the sidewalk and the curb first. Okay, the soil is level with the sidewalk and the curb. Uh-huh. Is it best to remove a few inches of soil prior to laying down the drip and planting? Not over the whole area. But what you are going to want to do in that case is you are probably going to want to remove some soil or just temporarily and bury that header because if it's even, you don't want that header to stick up. That's a little bit bigger. Uh, and then if you're going to be planting and mulching, what I do is I'll remove just enough soil around the entire edge of that planting, like where the soil meets the sidewalk. So when I do my mulch layer, the mulch isn't falling down onto the sidewalk, it's nice and even. But if in the middle of the planting, you know, over most of the width, it's a little bit higher, that's just fine. So you just really wanna pay attention to the edges. Uh, from Christine, does the blue lock work the same way as the PVC, meaning just tubing that gets buried that the drip emitter lines plug into? Yes. And sometimes depending on the landscape as well, if it's not right near the edge of the landscape, I will, or if just, just depending on, uh, 
I guess how di you know different factors, foot traffic, things like that. Sometimes with PVC, I will always make sure it's buried. Sometimes the blue lock, I'll just leave it on top of the soil, but buried in the mulch. If it's always going to have a thick mulch layer, uh, just like the drip, it's just bigger. You know, three quarter inch can put more water through it. So it's it's useful that way. It's a little more flexible. Uh, and so, and the last question, can you use a half inch tubing made of the same material as the header, but instead of the PVC or blue lock? Yes, but you just can't put as much water through it. And so that comes back to, in the previous slides, I give the guidelines of like how many linear feet of the drip line you can run off of a half inch pipe or a three quarter inch pipe. So as long as it works, you know, the amount of drip line you're running works off a half inch pipe, absolutely, you can just use all half inch flexible pipe, no problem at all. Okay, and then finally, if you are going from an existing system where you have a very typical like lawn valve system like this, this is what I had at my house, and you are converting, here's what you could do. Uh, and I'm gonna show a couple of things. I'm going to show both uh, how you would put in the drip filter, but also in this example, uh, there is a very small planting bed. So I'm actually gonna swap out the valve while I'm at it to show how you would swap out the valve with a low flow valve, which is meant for drip. That's not doing a big area, like I mentioned at the beginning of the class. And so it's kind of two things at once. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that the water going to the valve is off. If you are lucky, it will have been installed with an isolation valve. So from the main line, you can turn that off. You don't need to turn off the water to the whole house to do this work, especially because there's gonna be some gluing on the side where the main line is. And so if that was the case and you didn't have this, you would need to leave the water off to the house overnight to accommodate this. I will also say that this is a more advanced project. If you are going to be making changes at the valve because you're working on the main line, than everything else we talked about. So sometimes people, even if they're gonna do the rest, will hire a plumber or a landscape contractor to do this part. You really don't wanna have any, if you have something leaking after the valve, uh, you can just turn off the valve, stop it from running for a while. If you have something leaking before the valve, that's always gonna leak if the water to the house is on. And to fix that, you have to turn off the water at the water meter at the street and you lose water to the rest of your house if you don't have this isolation valve. Also, if, if a leak develops, uh, there can be a lot more water that happens a lot more quickly on the main line because it'll just keep, keep running as opposed to a leak on the other side of the valve. It will only run when the timer tells it to run. So anyways, what you would do is you need to dig down, find where it connects, give yourself some working space by cutting it out. And there's a separate video on this. So I'm gonna go through pretty quickly just to show you what's entailed. You're gonna to wanna to watch the video if you're actually gonna do it. Then here, you're going to, if you are only going to be adding in this filter pressure reducer, you would screw that in here with some thread seal tape. One tip is when you screw these on, the way, that they work is you need to take off the cap and the filter and that makes it less long, which means you can actually screw it in. The, the piece is too long to screw all the way around. It'll be hitting this back part if you don't uh, take that off. But if you're gonna be doing the whole thing, then you would cut back to the supply line, clean everything. And then you would work with your thread seal tape, attach, risers that you get at the irrigation store, but then you're gonna glue the bottom parts. So you can cut off the threads, assemble as much as you can outside the hole to keep everything nice and clean. And then you glue it back in place. I share some uh, tips for how to do that in the video. And then you have to connect back to your line if you're gonna be resaving any of this line. And so I do also like that PVC lock for that because it's flexible. The glue's not drying as you're trying to wiggle things together. And then at the top, you would then wire in that new valve. There were inside rated, which often you do see inside rated. Uh, so meant for like doing electric work inside the house, but not to be outside uh, wire nuts. And so you want to replace those with ones that are meant for outside, which have a little bit of a gel 
to keep the elements off of the wires. And there we go. So let's see, had some questions come in. Uh, okay, good question, Christine. The question is, do you use thread seal tape and glue for each joint? It's either or. For joints where pipe is coming together where there are threads, you never use glue. You always use only thread seal tape. For fittings that come together where there are no threads between the pipe uh, for PVC, those are called slip fittings. And those are the ones that you glue together and it forms a chemical weld. So it's either or. Uh, good question. And so going into things like valves or things like that, it's always gonna be threaded. Uh, you use the thread seal tape. Normally, if you're gluing pipe together in long runs, uh, it's less pieces and cheaper, and it's a more solid long-term under the ground thing to glue it together. You wouldn't wanna glue it together like at the valve because if you need to swap or repair the valve, you can't unglue something, but you can unscrew something and put new thread seal tape on the end. Uh, okay, just has to put the last picture back up. So let me make sure. Uh, from Cindy, uh, let me know if that's the picture you wanted or if it was something else. Okay, and then another question. So the measurements are for any length, regardless of emitter holes, it's total distance. Uh, I think you are referring to the measurements that I mentioned for like the pipe size. That's actually some math that I did for you. It's actually the amount of water that goes through. And you can figure that, that out the long way by adding up the water capacity for the pipe, the emitter flow rate, the number of emitters, that's the real way to do it if you're doing professional irrigation design. But this is complicated enough that I can't really convey all of that and how to do that from scratch in a workshop like this. So I just gave you the general recommendations, but it is in fact based on the water flow, not the total distance of the line. And I did, did cut some of that math for you in those reference slides. Uh, Mark, yes, the thread seal tape I talked about is the same as Teflon tape, uh, two words for the exact same thing. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in these last few minutes is I am going to just explain to you what else is here. There are slides here and you can download the slides if you want the reference that talk about once you have this system in, how do you know how long to run your system for your plant types? That is a whole other thing. And it's more than we can get to today. However, what we have are some online resources. So if you go to cbwcd.org slash YouTube, that will bring you directly to this page which is our online workshop playlist. And these are recordings of all for the last like, year and a half of all of the online workshops that we've done. And there's a lot here, including the last time we taught this workshop and the supplemental videos about things like how to install drip irrigation. However, if you go, the easiest way to find everything relevant to this workshop is from here. If you just go back out to our main YouTube page, where we are also live streaming this right now, you can go to playlists. And you want to go to the playlist that is retrofitting lawn sprinklers for water wise and California native gardens. And if you view the full playlist, here is everything I mentioned before. Here is the recording of this workshop. Here is a whole other kind of mini supplement that tells you how to kind of schedule your irrigation with a irrigation system like this to know how long and how often to water. And we talk specifically about drip systems and about spray systems. And then there are videos. So there's you know, showing that sprinklers for water wise gardens, how, how to do that spray conversion kind of step-by-step, step. you see my hands do stuff as well, how to do the thread seal tape. There's installing the drip irrigation. I go over every single part as well as showing me do it. 
and then also a whole tutorial about how to do the valves. So lots more content. And I highly encourage you, if you're going to try to actually do this yourself, invest the time in it. It's really probably going to help. Uh, we've gotten good feedback on them. So it, it is worth checking out. Uh, if you check it out and you feel like there's something that is skipped and that you, you know, wish there was some other amount of information, get in touch with us and ask me because I will do another supplemental video or try to try to clear it up. And then within uh, the irrigation scheduling video, there is there are references to our Inland Valley Garden Planner website where we have some things like calculators to help you and, and walking you through step-by-step -step, some little tests to help you figure out your irrigation run times. We have recently improved the site and made those sections clear. So the formatting you will see is a little bit different from the screenshots, but basically if you type in how long to water, watch the video first, but after watching that video, we have some guidance for whether you have spray system. I need to update this picture. It's just what got put in by the web designers as the default here when we relaunched it because we don't want these little two inch pop-ups we talked about. But if you have a spray system or if you have a drip irrigation system, there are methods there. And then there are also tests here where you walk, we walk you through what to do, how to do a test, and then fill out this calculator, which will help spit out your recommended irrigation runtime for when you choose to run your irrigation system. And so with that, I think we will end the content portion and just focus on answering questions from here. But before we jump into questions, I would love to get some feedback from you. This is super difficult to try to teach in a one workshop format, but we go so deep into all of these details because when we teach more introductory classes and when I have watched other classes being taught that make it sound like it's super easy, you don't need to know much, just go out and do it. We also have programs where we then come and help people at their house with guiding them on improving their irrigation system and their efficiency. And I see everything that goes wrong. And if people knew just a little bit more, when they put it in, they could have maybe avoided some of those mistakes. So I realize in this workshop that I'm erring on being overwhelming with too much information. And we're always trying to refine how we teach this information to the public. So your honest feedback on this poll would be very useful. And then in addition, if you can let me know in the chat, if there's anything that you found that was particularly useful that maybe you hadn't heard before, you didn't understand from elsewhere, and that now you are going to be able to put into practice, it is super useful for me to hear that from you. You can type that into the chat because I will make sure we continue to include that content. If there is anything that just didn't make sense or was too overwhelming and just you think you know is not worth me covering, let me know that please in the chat as well because I really do take that into account next time I will teach the same topic eventually in the future. And so with that, I will start answering questions. And I will relaunch the screen share as well because there's just some of the web links and references on the last page of the slideshow. Okay, so let's get to the last of the questions. Okay. Okay, so from Mark. If we are rewatching these videos later and we have questions, is there an email you can send questions to? Yes. And I can't always get back to the emails right away, but the best email to send the questions to is design at cbwcd.org. And that will be much better than uh, posting like a comment or a question on the YouTube page because we aren't able to get around to answering those as often as I would like. 
Uh, the design at cbwcd.org email is one that both I and another member of my team monitor. And so, and we, we answer uh, from people who have participated in some of our other one-on-one uh, -on -one programs, we answer questions uh, on that email. So that would be the best one to try to reach us at. Uh, okay, so next question is, is it worth it to replace an analog timer with a smart timer? Yes, if you can, definitely. There is a new generation of irrigation timers, number of different brands. And some of what are called smart timers are ones that can automatically adjust how much they water based on the weather. So you still need to figure out and tell it. And, and we go into how to understand that in the supplemental video, you still need to understand and tell it generally, like in the hottest part of the year, how long and how often it should water. But then from there, they have an ability to track the weather and adjust down in the cooler parts of the year. This is great for typical landscapes like turf, fruit trees, vegetables, even like general Mediterranean gardens. For California native gardens, and we talk about why in the supplemental video, it's a little bit different because they go summer dormant. They actually need a little bit less water in summer, but then in the spring and fall, if it doesn't rain, if it's dry, like that's when they want to grow. So we need to water them a little bit more. However, most of the new smart timers are ones that if you have an ability to get your home Wi-Fi system to cover your irrigation timer. Like I have a detached garage, but my Wi-Fi system from my house gets to the garage just enough that my smart timer, even though I only use it in that smart weather sensitive mode for my fruit trees and my vegetable beds and not for like my front yard where I have native plants, you can make all of your adjustments because it's on Wi-Fi instead of needing to be there in the garage, pushing buttons on something that's not intuitive and looks kind of like a few buttons and you have to press the same button over and over again. Uh, most of the ones that get on Wi-Fi or all of them actually have a phone app and most of them have an interface you can also get on from your computer screen. And so it's a lot easier to make adjustments. And so for, I very minimally water my front yard. And so I almost always have it off. And then every three weeks or so, depending on the weather, I tell it to water once overnight. Uh, and so when I want to do that, I just pull up the app on my phone, hit a couple of buttons, say water tonight, and then it'll do that. And then I just need to remember to take that off uh, after that. And that's how I water my front yard. So it's still a big advantage to an old school timer, even though for that zone, I'm not using all of the smart functions. Highly recommended. And there are uh, rebates available to help offset the cost of smart timers. And for most areas in Southern California, it's through the regional metropolitan water district that uh, imports water for Southern California. And so you can check out the information on those rebates at SoCalWaterSmart.com. Type that into the chat. SoCalWaterSmart.com. If you happen to be in our local service area, so if you get your water from Monta Vista Water District, City of Upland, City of Ontario, City of Chino, City of Chino Hills, Cucamonga Valley Water District, or uh, Fontana Water Company. There's actually a local program where you can, if you do a quick online class, you can qualify to get a professional landscape contractor to install a smart timer at your home, if you have an existing timer, so the wires work, you know, the valves work and everything like that completely for free. So if you get your water from one of those water providers, uh, get in contact with your water provider, tell them you're interested in the, the landscape, the irrigation timer program. And oftentimes customer service can help you, but if not ask to talk to the water use efficiency person, and you can get connected with that program directly through them. Okay, next question. 
Do those other videos on YouTube show how to add more valves and more detail on the work with attaching the pressure regulator onto the valve. Uh, so the, the video does show in detail attaching the pressure regulator onto the valve. Uh, it doesn't show in general, like just how to add an extra valve. That's something that I kind of shy away on, away from because uh, in most cases, it's a little bit better to rely on someone with experience with plumbing to do that because it is always working on the main line, but I'm sure you can provide, you can find uh, other videos on YouTube with that content. There's a lot of plumbing sort of content on YouTube. Uh, I learned how to do all the interior plumbing of my house, which I had never done before on YouTube. So I'm sure you can find uh, the, the landscape part of that as well for the stuff that we don't have. If you know, you need a specific thing, like how to add a valve. Uh, okay. So a request to go back to the slide talking about water flow and tubing distances. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I'm going to search back for that slide. Oh, I've lost my Q&A. Uh, looking for that right now, Christine. Okay, so this is gonna be the best slide. And I will explain this again with the caveat that this is typical in our area. What we mostly see is people using, because of our soils, the 0 0.9 or one gallon per hour emitters spaced every one foot down the drip line. And so I kind of went ahead and I did the math in terms of the maximum runs for what you would put through a different pipe size in terms of that's figured out by the water flow based on this most typical line that we use. And so if you're using that line with the one foot spacing, 0 0.9 or one gallon per hour emitters in that line off of a three quarter inch supply line, you can do about 800 linear feet of it off of a one half supply line, whether that's the flexible drip tube or the solid PVC pipe, you can do 250 linear feet. But if you do it in a loop, you can get up a little bit more up to 313 linear feet. So hopefully that is of help. And then you could sort of extrapolate from there, you know, if you have a uh, one foot spacing with the 0 0.25, sometimes 0 0.26, but close to a quarter of that uh, gallon power emitter, that's be like for heavy clay soil. If you have that one foot spacing, you can do four times as much because it's about water flow. Uh, if you have a wider spacing than that, like if it was an 18 inch spacing down that line uh, with those quarter gallon per hour emitters. I think the math, quick math in my head, that added up to six times as much. So you can do a lot more pipe, but don't just use the smaller flow emitters to be able to get more pipe length in to have like less connections. Because if you have sandy soil, you won't get the horizontal, like as, as the water drips into the landscape, you won't get it to spread out wide enough uh, kind of horizontally. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's that's a general guideline. Uh, okay. Uh, so from Tim, don't live in the Chino Basin area. Can you recommend any contacts, contacts or resources for irrigation for the west of you? We'll have to start over from scratch on the system. We need some help on parts of the project. You live in San Gabriel. Uh, Depending on what you need, if you're looking to hire a contractor for the whole thing, uh, you can look on Yelp or Angie's List or also the local landscape supply stores. So in uh, San Gabriel, 
the two local landscape supply stores mainly in that area. I used to live out in San Gabriel Valley. There's one called JHM Supply. That's J hm supply and there's one called landscape warehouse those are the two major like landscape supply stores that carry all the irrigation parts if it's just kind of help on parts to get you can go in there and ask when you're buying your stuff if you're looking to hire someone like locally to help you out like actually put stuff in or do some valve changes uh sometimes for things like just a small amount of work if you're going to be doing the rest you know it's going to be hard to uh call someone on yelp and get a landscape contractor to come out, but you can call those local landscape supply stores and say like, hey, I, I need a small you know, job, just help with some valves or something like that. Or, or you know, even like you, you're looking for help on you know, putting in this type of drip system. Do you have recommendations? And usually they will have recommendations of people who are some of you know, like the professional contractors that do small residential jobs that come into their store all the time. You know, still ask for references, check up on them like you were hiring a contractor to do anything else. Uh, but that that's sometimes a successful way to just find someone local in your area who has a decent reputation, who knows their stuff is, is to call the, the landscape supply stores and say, here's the kind of project I have. Do you have anyone you recommend I would get in contact with? Uh, so that is some recommendations on, on uh, yeah, how to go with that. And then in terms of Kind of rounding out what we talked today with general like if you're going to try to do some of the work yourself as well uh i can't remember all of what they have online but for general basic stuff so we have a number of uh more basic irrigation workshops and then also the rainbird the company rainbird on their website they have a whole section for homeowners with some good information as well that might be worth checking out Okay, thank you very much, everybody. That gets us through the questions. I hope you all have a good rest of your weekend and I hope you join us in the future for our future workshops. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.